Uh, I would like to introduce uh, Professor uh, Dilip Kumar Padan. So he is uh, uh, now presently working as associate professor at the uh, Department of Physics, uh, National Institute of Technology, Rahul Kala. And uh, he is uh, working on the ferroelectrics and the, the related devices. Is a uh, uh, PhD from IIT Kharagpur, and uh, he has a couple of years in uh, postdoc in USA. He has more than uh, 100 uh, publications with a number of uh, PhD stu uh, students uh, awarded by him. And uh, he is, uh, uh, I think, uh, five, uh, uh, five uh, um, research project has completed. So uh, I request and I invite uh, Professor Dilip Kumar Pradhan to share his PPT and uh, start uh, his uh, invited talk. Thank you very much. A very good morning to all of you. Am I audible to all of you? Yes, please. Yes, yes. Okay. Thank you, Bhubai, for your nice introduction. Today, I will be speaking about the topic. The title of my presentation is Structural Phase Transitions. And at last, I will try to explain you what is the effect if we go for the nano regime, what is the effect of this size effect on the ferroelectric properties? Mainly, we'll discuss about how the structure is changing. The structure part we try to describe <laughs> from two different uh, experimental techniques, that is from XRD and Raman. And after that one, how the size effect is affecting the physical properties. In, in case of physical properties, we will try to describe the dielectric properties and the ferroelectric properties. And finally, I will conclude my lecture by some conclusion. The 15 minutes, I will try to spend, uh, although the ferroelectric phenomena is mainly governed by the crystal symmetry, However, the crystal symmetry part is very rarely adopted by the different people. So still there are some misunderstanding in, even if in the MSc level uh, symmetry. So that part I'll try to spend you some 10, 15 minutes so that it will be more clear how the structural phase transition of ferroelectric materials that is related to symmetry and, and the crystal symmetry, mainly I'm telling about the space group, I'm telling about the point view. And those, how that affecting the phase transition phenomena, how this group theoretical calculation is applicable in this case, I'll try to spend some time. After spending some time, then directly I'll go for the application, the side effect behavior of these ferroelectric materials. So, <laughs> before going to the topic, uh, all of we know the nature, nature law of symmetry. So, whenever we are uh, Around whenever you wake up in the morning, we have started with the symmetry. Whenever we go for the bed, at that time also we are accepting, the, we are adopting the symmetry. The first symmetry phenomena, this is the, I, I took a leaf, I took this photograph. Photograph is for a leaf. In this case, the symmetry is, if I rotate a two-fold rotation, if I rotate 180 degree, I'll get the symmetrical equivalent position. So how many types of symmetry are possible? That I'll tell in the subsequent slides. Then this is a butterfly. If I put a mirror here exactly between this one, this will be mirror reflection of each other. This is just like a translational symmetry. This is like a center of inversion. So this, how this symmetry is related to this uh, crystallography and how it is related to this one. Let me speak uh, two, three words. All of you know the three type of symmetry, primary point group symmetry, that is rotation, inversion and mirror reflection. And whenever this symmetry operation operate on a unit cell, that 
give rise to protein Bravis lattices. And that protein Bravis lattices corresponds to the seven crystal systems. And this seven crystal system, all of you know the correlative properties are isotrop anisotropic in nature. This means that the property at uh, whenever we see the property at a particular direction, at that direction, the property is more than as compared to the other directional properties. So that's why we are putting this symbol. All this symbol makes the uh, symbol warm. So the nature of symmetry is always associated with the nature and natural phenomena. That's what I wanted to tell you. So this is my plan of presentation. As I told, <laughs> I'll try to give a general introduction what we are doing mistake in understanding the point group and the crystal systems or the seven crystal system also. Maybe most of the textbook also how they are doing this mistake, that part I'll try to tell you. Then after that, I'll try to explain the phase transition associated with the ferroelectric system. There are two types of phase transition. One is first order phase transition, second one is second order phase transition. Although both these phase transitions are related to the Landau theory of phase transition, I'll not go uh, about the Landau theory of phase transition and its calculations. I'll only tell what is the difference between the first order and second order phase transition. After that, in the ferroelectric system, there are two types of phase transition in upper, that is called displacive phase transition and the order degenerator. Sometimes people are, instead of using degenerator, they use the word misorder, order misorder phase transition. And another type of phase transition, most of the cases, the metallurgist use, that is called the reconstructive phase transition. After that, I'll take the classical example of this barium titanate. In case of barium titanate, whenever the phase transition is taking place, how? The phase transition is related to group theoretical calculation. If you we, if we want to really understand the phase transition phenomena, in case of ferroelectric materials, how group theoretical calculation is very, very important. Here, I, I, I'll try to give you some idea. But um, the representation theory, group theory, and the application of the representation theory, that is very, very essential to understand the structural phase transition phenomena in case of ferroelectric system. And finally, I'll explain you some of this uh, work, which is carried out by one of my master students. And uh, in this case, although we are knowing the barium titanate phase transition is somewhat what we read in classical textbook, how that is actually different, what we usually now uh, have the <laughs> experimental technique, the sophisticated in in instrumentation has been available to us and sophisticated computational facility available to us, how this facility are helping us to more accurately, accurately understanding the phase tension phenomena, that part I'll tell. I'll take the example of the classical example of the barium diameter. And finally, I'll <laughs> explain you the size effect on ferroelectric behavior. Okay. This is my plan of presentation. As I'm telling about the ferroelectric materials, let me give some introduction about the ferroelectric and so what are the application of these ferroelectric materials uh, knowingly or unknowingly <laughs> how so many sensors we are using now on and all of them are <laughs> based upon these ferroelectric materials that part will try to describe <laughs> all these materials if you go to the broad spectrum materials materials can, can be classified in terms of <laughs> uh, insulator semiconductor and conductor Dielectrics are the special class of insulators. This means, in, in case of dielectrics, if the electrical behavior can be changed by the application of electric, then those insulators are called the dielectrics. And the dielectric phenomena, if I do the experiment of charge with respect to time by loading and unloading, this behavior will be there. <coughs> then, from out of all these dielectrics, there are some materials, those are called piezoelectrics. Piezoelectrics means piezo what means that is called pressure. By the application of pressure, <coughs> if strain is being sorry, if electric field is being developed or the polarization is being developed, then that is called piezoelectric, that is called in direct piezoelectric effect. And in, and in the case of in converse piezoelectric effect, <coughs> if I apply the electric field, if the strain is being developed, that is called the converse piezoelectric effect. The characteristic experimental observation is if I apply the mechanical stress, the charge increases, the charge per unit volume, the polarization should increase. <laughs> another type of uh, insulator, another type of materials, which is a subgroup of piezoelectric, that is called pyroelectric. If the polarization can be changed by the application of temperature, that is called pyroelectric effect. 
and I take the derivative of this polarization dp by dt and whenever there will be maximum change in the polarization will be there that time you will get the peak and this corresponds to maximum change in the pyroelectric coefficient <laughs> and this pyroelectric coefficients are applicable for so many device applications and the, the subgroup of pyroelectric is called ferroelectric ferroelectric means if a material has to stable state of polarization and those polarization can be reversed by the application of electric field so that it will trace a hysteresis loop, P hysteresis loop, then those materials are called ferroelectric materials. <laughs> Another way also we can characterize these ferroelectric materials. If you plot the strain versus electric field, you will get the uh, butterfly loop. That is the characteristic feature for a, for a <laughs> ferroelectric materials. So most of the cases, as I, again I am telling the ferro one, if we are bringing from the ferromagnetic, as the ferroelectric and ferromagnetic behave be giving the same type of hysteresis loop, <laughs> means PE or MH loop. So in this case also, the ferro one we are, we are bringing from ferromagnetic, the ferroelectric is nowhere related to any of this, may be related to any of this iron-based compound, but it not it, 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 it may not be necessary that ferroelectric should contain any, any, any materials related to iron containing compound. These ferroelectric materials are called smart materials. What is the meaning of smart? If we go to the dictionary, there are several definitions of the smarts are there. The first definition is to feel mental distress or irritation, alert, clever, capable, and stylish. All this word, whatever we are telling, <laughs> these words are applicable for smart materials. Okay. So, the, so whenever we are thinking about any smart materials, this means that whenever it causes one mental distress to think of ceramics, whenever the ceramic will be there, but by the help of feedback circuit, how this mental distress will be avoided, that should also come into account. That's why whenever we are thinking about the smart materials, means whenever a material which can sense and due to the change in the environment and do the needful by using this feedback system, then it is called a it is called a smart materials. And in case of smart materials, it is consist of mainly sensor and actuators. So what I can define, I can define a smart materials means a change in the environment and respond by changing or changing one or more of its property coefficient. If this condition will be satisfied, then this materials is called the smart materials. To give the example, to give the example, in this case, I'm I am thinking our body is a very smart material, our body. If I tell about our host total materials body, our body, it is consist of some brands. Brands is called the distributed control center. It consists of the nodes, which is the sensor. It consists of the muscles that has called the actu actuators. First, let me define what do, you, what do you mean by um, sensors and actuators. Sensor means, sensor is a device which responds to an input quantity and by generating the functional, functionally related output quantity that is called the sensor. Our temperature, our thermometer is a temperature sensor. Okay, so now most of the cases, whatever the temperature sensor also we are using with the COVID cases, they are also based upon the IR sensor and that IR sensor can be applicable, can be applicable, can be prepared by some ferroelectric material. That's what I'll throw, I, I'll also show you in my subsequent slides. Okay, so the sensor means it is a device. If I give some input, it will generate the functionally related output. The output will be in the form of electrical or optical signal. If I have some, if it will have some in terms of electrical signal or optical signal, what will happen? That optical signal can be easily visualized to the general public. That's why it will it will convert into electrical and optical signal. So the example of this one is the strain gate, optical fiber, piezoelectric crystal, self memory error. These are the examples. So what is actuator? Actuator means an actuator is a type of motor for moving or controlling a mechanism or a system. It is operated by means of some source of energy and it converts that energy into motion. I, in this case, an actuator is the mechanism by which the control system acts upon this environment. So the, our smart system, smart materials is consist of some actuators, some motors and some power sources. So the example of these actuators are 
the piezoelectric crystals in this case the shape changes whenever the voltage is applied the shape memory alloy in this case the shape changes by the specific temperature this magnetorheological properties the viscosity changes by the application of magnetic field electrodeological properties the viscosity changes by the application of electric field these are some of this general sensors but uh, other type of actuators are also there so based upon this one whenever we have a smart structure the smart structure should consist of a control system it should consist of some sensor it should consist of some actuator the control system what will happen it will transmit the data to the sensor and and, and what will happen the sensor and actuator they will interrelate with each other and the actuator will give the instruction to the control system so that the smart structure will give this one in this case what will happen whatever the control system is giving based upon this feedback circuit again it will change its behavior after changing its behavior whatever the materials will be there the materials changes its situation according to the environment so our body can also be, a, be the one of this best example of this, this <laughs> smart structure so the stamps so what is a smart structure a smart structure is a system that incorporate particular function of sensing actuating to perform this smart action ingenious ingenious way if i take our body our body is a consist of brain nerves and muscles our brain that boy brain is, is the distributed control system it will control this one our sensor is the nerves and our muscles is the actuators and whenever we give the power source to the muscles and nerves they will interact and that they, they, they must be controlled by means of the control system whenever necessary it will give the feedback so that accordingly our sensor and uh, our nerves and the muscles that means the sensor and actuators that are those are working so these are the smart structure system that are consist of the ferroelectric materials i'm showing this slide because although we are using this car see how many types of piezoelectric and ferroelectric sensor that has been used these are the so many types of piezoelectric and ferroelectric sensor are different part of this car that are being used so what are the ferroelectric application the ferroelectric application is high piezoelectric coefficient this means in the ir detector in most of the cases covid cases the temperature is being measured based upon this ir detector that can be prepared by means of some ferroelectric materials high piezoelectric coefficient that will be piezoelectric actuator and piezoelectric sensor if the materials have high permittivity it will act as a dram dram means i'll explain in the next slide and the others are called the electro-optic properties means electrical property changes by the optical behavior and this is called the tunability tunability means the electrical property changes by the application of electric voltage or electric and in this case other cases are called the non-volatile ferroelectric random access memory non-volatile ferroelectric random access memory means in this case how ferroelectric materials can be used as non-volatile random access memory in my next slide i'll try to Explain what, <laughs> what is the meaning of NVRAM? NVRAM is non volatile ferroelectric random access memory. If, you, if somebody wants to understand, try to read this article. This article is very accurately represents what is the meaning of non volatile random access memory. Let me first tell you what you mean by random access memory. Although all of you know, for a general sense, let me define. Random memory. For example, previously, tape recorder. In the tape recorder, if I have to listen the song, a few songs from a cassette, what I have to do? I have to listen first song, second song, third song, then fourth song without making forward or backward. All these songs I have to listen, but in case of if I, if I want to listen the song from this computer, I can randomly assess first song, fourth song, eighth song, or tenth song. That's why it is called randomly assess memory. Previously, whenever the random assess memory was used, that is mainly based upon a dielectric materials. Dielectric means, in this case, the polarization versus electric field that will become straight line. They are, they are linearly relationship. So, in this article, what they told, let a student is writing the last chapter of his thesis in a hot summer. And tomorrow is the last date for the submission of his thesis. Okay. And the system of this computer is not a non-volatile random access memory. It is a 
and any random access memory it is remembered. Let suddenly the power goes off and the student forgot to save the data whatever he did. And the power is not coming within 2, 3, 4, 5 hours and tomorrow morning he has to submit the record. In that case, if the, if the memory is not non-volatile random access memory, what will happen? If, if the student forgot to save the data, whatever the data is there, the data can be recovered. But if your materials, if the memory is based upon the correlated random access memory, because in that case, the data, you can recover this data. How that is happening, let me explain. In case of dialectics materials, if I plot the polarization versus electric field loop, it will become straight line. If I increase the electric field, the polarization increases, and you can save the data. Whenever the power goes up, automatically it will come to zero. This means that you are not able to save the data. But if your materials is ferroelectric materials, let us take by increasing this electric field, you are going to this state. Even if the power goes up, even if the electric field is zero, the polarization is not zero. If the polarization is not zero, means in this case the data, all this data that cannot be, that 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 means all this data that cannot be. And that can be revived, whatever the data, this much of data that can be revived. That's why this is called the random and NV RAM. NV RAM is non volatile random access memory. If you use the ferroelectric method, there will be two stable state of polarization. These two stable state of polarization plus P and minus P that corresponds to the two stable memory devices that is mainly applicable of this ferroelectric method. And depending upon this uh, application of this ferroelectric materials, uh, what an experimentalist choose for? The experimentalist choose for depending upon these are the two parameters we are measuring. One is called the polarization versus temperature. In case of ferroelectric materials, by with increasing the temperature, the polarization decreases. Above the phase transition temperature, the polarization is equal to zero. Okay. And in case of dielectric, in, if, we, if I want to measure the dielectric properties with increase in the temperature, the dielectric constant increases and it is maximum around PC, then it is decreases. Okay. And finally, at that time, whenever the, there will be maximum polarization, if whenever the change in the polarization is maximum, dp by dt will be equal to maximum around this. If my polarization is maximum, that will be used for memory devices. If accordingly, we have to choose the materials which polarization is maximum. If I have to choose the materials for capacitor application, where the material's dielectric constant is high or the, or the dielectric permittivity is high, you have to choose the materials where the, the dielectric permittivity should be very, very high. Similarly, for the electro optic application or the sort of piezoelectric transducer application, the material should have high piezoelectric coefficient. Based upon your requirement, you have to choose the materials, and the material's property can be tuned by the uh, by the by changing its chemical pressure. Chemical pressure means by the substitution, by changing its synthesis technique, by changing the different behavior. The material's parameter can be changing. Most of the cases in my our group we are doing to we, we are doing the changing in the different behavior by the changing in the chemical pressure. We try to apply apply different synthesis technique. We try to give different uh, chemical substitution at the different site to tune the physical properties. So I'll, I'll this slide. So let me define what do you mean by ferroelectric materials. Relative materials means the materials which are permanent dipole, dipole, permanent dipole. This has the positive and the center of the positive charges, and the center of the negative charges. They don't coincide with each other, and they have the lack of center of symmetry. Center of symmetry means all, all of you know that if a materials which have a center of inversion, that will become center of symmetry. Center of inversion symmetry operation is there. That is called center of symmetry. Any materials having the center of symmetry that cannot show the relativities. Or the piezoelectric properties. So all the ferroelectrics must be piezoelectric, although the converse is not true. And third one is all the ferroelectric materials have one or more phase transition. Then whenever there will be phase change taking place, the phase transition will be from one phase to another phase. <laughs> then whenever the phase transition is taking place, some of the symmetry operations are the symmetry describing that unit cell that will be disappearing. If some of this phase, if some of the symmetry operation is disappearing. That phenomena in the moral language of phase tension that is called the symmetry breaking in phase tension. Immediately above the phase tension temperature, they show the Fury Weiss law and the relative materials, which the, which the, the materials which have the characteristic property. If I plot the polarization versus electric field, it will show the uh, P hysteresis look. So these are the um, 
to behave around the properties of the ferroelectricity. So I'll tell you one or two minutes uh, by the history of this ferroelectric. <laughs> the history of this ferroelectric means last year we have celebrated the 100 years of discovery of ferroelectricity. In 1920, 2021, we have this. We have celebrated the discovery, 100 years of discovery of ferroelectricity. Although ferroelectric previously some different people are there, but the first ferroelectricity was. Uh, discovered in Rosselli salt, Rosselli salt, potassium tetrahydrate, potassium tartrate, tetrahydrate. This ferroelectric was first discovered by, first discovered in Rosselli salt in 1920. Whenever this ferroelectric was discovered during that time, people are able to measure the polarization versus electric field. As the polarization versus electric field behavior is similar to the ferroelectric ferromagnetic materials. That's why they bring the term ferro and use the word electric. That's why it is known as ferroelectric. Whenever this ferroelectric supercity was discovered in 1920, but the first the, the first uh, experiment, whenever it was carried, carried out, they got the ferroelectric phenomena. But whenever subsequently some of these experiments had been carried out, although they are not able to reproducible this data because it is very difficult to stabilize the potassium tartrate tetrahydrate. If there will be a small deviation in the chemical formula, then the ferroelectric property would not be observed. That's why the ferroelectric phenomena, the first ferroelectric phenomena, although discovered by the Rosselli salt, but it didn't get more attention by the scientific community. And the second is the ferroelectric phenomena, in case of this one, is only observed between the temperature minus 18 degree to 24 degree centigrade. Below that temperature or above that temperature, the ferroelectricity was not discovered. After that, then the ferroelectricity was discovered in KH2PFR, this is called potassium dihydrogen phosphate in 1935. In this case, the phase transition temperature, they observed 122 degree Kelvin. And up to this one, people are thinking that the hydrogen bonded system is the necessity condition for the ferroelectricity. Because in the Rosselli salt, in the potassium dihydrogen phosphate also, the hydrogen bonding is there. The hydrogen bondings are the necessity for the uh, ferroelectric system. The second ferroelectric and the third ferroelectric was discovered during the Second World War in 1941. And that is the barium titanate. Different group of people, uh, few people from United States of America, few people from USSR, then USSR, they discovered the barium titanate and they uh, find out that this barium titanate is the ferroelectric materials which during that time also it was used for underwater transducer application. But this barium titanate discovery brings so many fast. So many fast means so many things fast. This is the first barium titanate which is without hydrogen bonded systems. This is the first barium titanate which is a ceramic oxides. This is the first barium titanate, first barium titanate ferroelectric which have more than one phase transition temperature. This is the first barium titanate, which is at the paraelectric state. Before these two cases, the paraelectric state was not obvious. So after that, so many types of different phenomena have been discovered by the different group of people and different type of ferroelectric materials have been discovered. Still, still even if after the discovery of around 80 years of discovery of barium titanate, the phase transition phenomena and the mechanism associated with the barium titanate still some still some research is there and still some more research is necessary to understand the exact phase tension of this barium titanate. The ferroelectricity, the events were discovered by the different age and this is the mainly the up to 2000 to 2020 uh, that phenomena still needs some importance. The first one is 1920 20 to 30, this is called the age of Rosselli salt, Rosselli salt period. This is the discovery of ferroelectricity. And 30 to 40, in this case, KDPH, KDPH means the potassium dihydrogen phosphate is there. During that time, people are trying to understand the thermodynamics called theory of phase transition. And in this case, people are understanding that the hydrogen bonding is the necessary for the phase transition hydrogen bonding. In this case, uh, the uh, movement of this uh, proton is giving rise to the, uh, in the double well potential that give rise to the phase transition. And 40 to 50, this is the early barium titanate age. 
the, during that time the barium titanate was discovered and high dielectric constant was observed that's why so many this was uh, also applied for so many device application and 50 to 60 period of proliferation proliferation means in that period so many different type of ferroelectricity was discovered uh, starting from the barium titanate layer titanate potassium sorry sodium bismuth titanate or so many types of ferroelectricity were discovered and 60 to 70 age of high science the soft mode the order parameter so many types of science different group of people try to give the different theoretical explanation for the understanding of the phase tension <laughs> 70 to 80 the age of diversification this ferroic electro optic thermistor these are the property discovered and 80 to 90 people are trying to integrate by composite package composite and integrating this one and now 1990 to 2000, the age of mini chime miniaturization. This means here the size effect, how to manipulate the size to get the maximum property was discovered. After 2000, now the another type of phenomena is coming that is called the multiferrex. Multiferrex means in this case, people are trying to combine this ferroelectric and ferromagnetic properties. So that what will happen if we speak about the memory, the post state memory can be achievable. So, as I told, I'll be speaking some phenomena related to the symmetry. All of you know the symmetry operation means if we operate that operation, before the operation and after the operation, the unit cell will be related to cell. So, what is the symmetry operation? We have the rotation, we have the inversion, we have the mirror reflection. These are the three types of point group symmetry operations are there. All of them can be best accurately represented in terms of this matrix operation. Whenever these operations will be combined with this inversion, the rotation will be combined with this inversion, we will get the roto inversion. The roto inversion is 1 bar, 2 bar, 3 bar, 4 bar. All of you know there will be only proper 5 types of rotations are possible 1 fold, 2 fold, 3 fold, 4 fold, and 6 fold. And if I took the inversion, I'll this one. Why I'm telling this one? Because Whenever we are describing this ferroelectricity, the ferroelectricity are mainly related to the symmetry. Whenever we apply this symmetry operation on a unit cell, that gives the restriction on the axis and angle so that we are getting the seven crystal system. Most of the cases of textbook, what they represent, they represent that based upon the relation between the axis and the angle between them, that gives rise to the symmetry for the seven crystal system. But that is not the truth. What is the true? The true is the crystal system should be defined based upon what is the characteristic symmetry operations are there for a particular crystal system. Whenever that characteristic symmetry operation operates on a unit cell that gives the restriction on A, B, C and alpha, beta, gamma so that the seven crystal system can be defined. So this way we have seven crystal system but the seven crystal system is triclinic, monoclinic, orthorhombic, tetragonal, cubic, trigonal. In case of trigonal there will be two hexagonal and rhombohedral and the hexagonal. So I will not go details about this one. What I wanted to tell, based upon these operations, we can have 32 point groups. Out of this 32 point groups, what we will see, we see that whatever the yellow mark are there, all these yellow mark symbols, they are called the uh, central symmetry. These cannot show the ferroelectric properties because center of symmetry means if I take a matrix of inversion, minus one, minus one, minus one along this body diagonal, if I apply with any of this operation, let us take polarization Px, Pi, Pz, before the operation, after the operation, if I compare, the polarization will be equal to zero. That's why the symmetry, the symmetry operation to understand the phase tension is very, very important. So these are the cases of the protein graphics lattices. After the defining this 32 point group, what I wanted to tell in terms of ferroelectric systems, these are the center of symmetry. This cannot show the ferroelectric properties. Along with this one, another symmetry is there, 4, 3, 2. These also cannot show the ferroelectric properties. And these rest of them are piezoelectric. Out of these piezoelectric properties, these are the only 10 point groups. These 10 point groups only show the ferroelectric properties. So the understanding of the symmetry, understanding of the ferroelectric property to tuning other properties for all these cases, this understanding is also very, very important to understand the how the how the symmetry defines the ferroelectric properties. I will spend some time here because most of the cases in classical textbook also they represent the seven crystal system in a different way. 
in case of hierarchy of symmetry if i take a cubic system a equal to b equal to c alpha beta gamma is equal to 90 degree how from the cubic system all this rest system can be derived the first one is cubic if a cubic will be there if you drag it along this c axis such that a b a equal to b not equal to c i will get the tetragonal if you, and if i drag with uh, along this b axis i will get the orthorhombic and if i change the alpha bit sorry beta value then i will come to the monoclinic finally i come to the triclinic if i take a cubic the cubic and monoclinic they are inter directly interrelated the only difference is in case of cubic a equal to b equal to c alpha beta gamma equal to 90 degree but in this case this is not equal to 90 degree this means that if you take a cube drag it along this body diagonal such that if a b c is equal to same but alpha beta gamma not equal but not 90 degree that will become a rhombohedral and from the rhombohedral if i change a b c then i will get the monoclinic highland triclinic this is the way hierarchy of symmetry is there what is the meaning of hierarchy of symmetry the meaning of hierarchy of symmetry means whenever the phase transition will be taking place the phase transition you cannot go from direct cube, cube to triclinic to go for cube to triclinic or to go for cube to orthorhombic the phase transition will follow the path cubic to tetragonal tetragonal to orthorhombic orthorhombic to rhombohedral in this way the phase transition phenomena in case of ferroelectrics they follow a path that path must be obeying the group theoretical calculation group subgroup relationship between the phases this is what i wanted to tell <laughs> now let me define what do you mean by a phase transition i spent uh, 10 5 10 minutes related to the phase transition then directly i'll go to my result phase means whenever a something material is consist of uh, whenever the solid is consist of atoms or molecule it may be homogeneous or the non homogeneous part the homogeneous part is called the phases and that homogeneous part is characterized by <laughs> parameters the thermodynamical parameter like volume pressure temperature whenever the system is stable if it gives free energy will be minimum if the gift energy is not minimum it is present in a local minima instead of a global minima then the metastable materials is called the metastable state whenever something will be in the metastable state by changing this parameter it will go to the unstable state whenever whenever the materials will be unstable if there should not be any barrier between the gift field energy exists then that is called the unstable state and whenever the materials will be on the unstable state it will come to the stable state by changing its structure, by changing its somewhat thermodynamical parameter. And that change, if during this phase from the unstable state to stable state is coming, by changing of structure, that is called the structural phase transition. <laughs> so whenever a solid undergo a phase transition, whenever a solid undergo a phase transition, because the solid is unstable, if under some under some thermodynamical condition, it will go from a phase, phase transition from one phase to another phase. Whenever it is going from phase transition from one phase to another phase, depending upon the changing of the thermodynamical parameter, we can represent them as the first order phase transition or the second order phase transition. If a phase transition is taking place, always the phase transition. It's characterized by the discontinuous change of at least one of these properties. Depending on the discontinuous changes of, of each one of these properties, we can characterize a phase tension as first order phase tension or the second order phase tension. So all of you know the Helmholtz potential is equal to this one. At the Helmholtz energy, A e is equal to A e, F is equal to E minus T S, E is equal to kinetic energy plus potential energy. So I can write the Q sphere energy is equal to F into P B. I can write E minus T S plus P B. If I are taking the contribution of magnetic contribution, it will be MB. If I don't take the magnetic contribution, the gift spin energy will be equal to this much. If I take the derivative, I will get this one. If I take the first derivative, delta P, delta G by delta P, I will get B, delta G by delta S, I will get the S. If the first in any phase transition, the gives free energy will be continuous changes. If the first order derivative will be discontinuous changes, then this is called a first order phase transition. First order derivative of the gives free energy with respect to pressure, we are getting the volume. With respect to temperature, we are getting the entropy. If there is a discontinuous change in the volume and the entropy is taking place with respect to the derivative of the gives free energy, then this is called a first order phase transition. And this head. 
and something also called as latent heat all of you know if the latent heat is is being involved delta h delta h is equal to t minus delta s if the latent heat is being involved then that is called the first order phase tension that's why the phase tension from ice to water over the water to gas that is a first order phase tension because in that case the, the latent heat is heat is being used the second case is the phase tension in the second order derivative is discontinuous around the phase tension then this is called a second order phase tension because of second order phase tension if i take the second derivative if it will be a specific heat or it will be a volume thermal expansivity or it will be a compressibility if the if if the volume thermal expansivity and the compressibility or the specific heat is discontinuous change with respect to temperature then it is called a second order phase tension but whenever this phase tension was previously de described people are thinking that if the anathermal derivative of the distant energy is changing then this is called the anathermal phase tension but all of you know that more than second order phase tension is not possible but based upon this calculation if you take the any more than second order phase tension is possible there is another type of phase tension that is called lambda tension also lambda tension people are representing that as a second order phase tension but that puts more confusion to understanding the phase tension related to that so how to characterize this phase tension if i have two gibbs free energy let us take here i have here i have two curve one curve is there another curve is there if these two curve will intersect with each other then if this is called a first order phase tension all of you know the first order derivative of a curve what it is uh, the slope if the slope is changing during this gibbs free energy with respect to temperature then this is called a first order phase tension and if the Uh, second order derivative the second order derivative means the curvature if the curvature is changing with respect to this one then this is called a second order phase tension it is a first order phase tension there will be two energy state and g1 and g2 g2 is the lowest energy state the stable state here g1 is the most energy state this is the not stable state if i if these two are intersect with each other we will get the phase tension this is called a first order this is called a second order phase tension in the second order phase tension the curvature is changing g1 and g2 without doing anything this power, this part will be what this part will be without uh, deviating this part if i connect this part without changing this one the path will be look like this but in case of second order phase tension as the curvature for both the cases is changing that's why this is called a second order phase tension another type of phase tension is called the reconstructive phase tension displacive phase tension and order mixed order phase tension in case of reconstructive phase tension what will happen the chemical bondings are broken and rejoin in most of the cases this is a first order phase tension the order mixed order phase tension means if there will be a phase tension below the phase tension temperature the molecules or the atoms they have been orderly arranged and above this phase tension temperature they have been disordered this is example of the order mixed order phase tension the best example of order mixed order phase tension is beta brass which is the alloy of copper and zinc whenever we are taking the beta plus copper and zinc let us take a is equal to copper z is equal to zinc below the phase tension temperature they have been regularly arranged above the phase tension they have been irregularly arranged in case of ferroelectric materials whatever we have discussed about the ks2 pf4 the potassium dihydrogen phosphate that is a order disorder or a order disorder phase tension because at local level they are ordered that's why instead of using disorder now people are using order disorder phase tension and crystallographically the order phase tension in case of order mixed order phase tension here you see that the copper and zinc they are located at the different available site or the different orbit in the point b but whenever it will become to the disorder state all of these atoms they will combine with each other this means that all the any atoms can occupy at any site that's why this is another explanation of the order disorder phase tension so based upon this one the last phase tension is called the displacive phase tension that displacive phase tension is that is mainly occurring in case of ferroelectric materials in our cases whenever it is occurring in case of ferroelectric materials that is called the displacive phase tension in case of displacive phase tension what will happen the bonds are not broken but the atoms of the molecule inside the unit cell they have been displacing by some distance and the displacement should be very very small the smaller than the interdecular distance as in this case the atoms and molecules they have been displaced from their equilibrium position so what will happen in this case the time period of this move will be just, just like the phonon vibration the phonon vibration means all of you know the phonon frequency time will be 10 to the power minus 11 to 10 to the power minus 15 so in case of displacement phase tension the atoms or the molecule they have been displaced from their equilibrium position and this two phase 
the phase before the phase tension, the temp the phase after the phase tension. There, there some there must be some relationship between this phase tension and <laughs> and these relationship are called the groups of group relationships. If all the symmetry operation describe the symmetry of this phase tension after this phase tension, this means the high temperature phase and that the low temperature phase, they must be obeying the group subgroup relationship. So this is one of these very fundamental aspects of the Landau theory of phase tension. Those who really want to understand the phase tension, they should go to the Landau theory of phase tension. And in Landau theory of phase tension, how explain explain it? Whatever the ferroelectric phenomena or the multiplex phenomena is there, how that how that has been related to the phase tension phenomena that has been explained. So the displacement phase tension, the best example is barium titanate. In case of barium titanate, what will happen? The barium atoms are at the corner of this unit cell. The titanium is at the center, and the oxygens are the phases. Below the above this phase tension, phase tension temperature, the titanium atom will be at the center of this unit cell. All of them are at the equilibrium position. Here the center of these positive charges and the center of the neg negative charges will be equal to zero, so that the metals will become paraelectric phase. But whenever we decrease the temperature, the titanium ion will move. Related to this one, you will see that the facial oxygen at these two places, whatever the oxygen will be there, and at the other places. The movement will be different. Whenever the movement will be different, the center of these positive charges and the center of the negative charges they give some dipole movement that give rise to the polarization value. Okay, this is the example of displacement phase transition and this phase transition. Whenever the displacement will be there, this displacement is very very small. So in this case, we have to, we'll use this a perovskite materials. The perovskite materials can be represented by means of the symbol A B. X3, X can be oxygen, X can be anything. A is the cation, which is the uh, oxidation state can vary from plus to plus three. B is a cation whose oxidation can vary from uh, plus three to plus five. And this is the oxygen. If you take this one, the charge balance will should be there for the materials to be ferroelectric. And whenever sometime what will happen? Whenever the phase transition will be taking place. Whenever we have to describe the phase transition, the choice of origin of this unit cell that entirely depend upon you, because whenever the whenever the phase transition will be taking place, whenever there will be transition from one point to oh, sorry one space group to another space group, whenever the structure will be changing from one structure to another structure, if you are not able to choose the exact origin, then your analysis of understanding this phase transition will be very very difficult. So the choice of origin is one of these very important phenomena. To understand this phase transition temperature, in this case, I am taking the same perovskite materials A B O three, A B X three, all of them one at this position. But here, what will happen? I am choosing my origin as B cation. The B cation is at the zero zero position, but here I am choosing my A cation at the zero 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 zero. So this means that whenever the phase transition is changing from high uh, high temperature phase, high symmetry phase to low symmetry phase, if The choice of the origin will be accurate. Then you will be able to speak what are the symmetry operation that are vanishing, so that the uh, symmetry breaking phase transition is being taking place. That can be you can easily calculate. So based upon this one, in ferroelectric materials, there are three type of phase transitions are mainly occurring. In case of barium, in case of perovskite materials, those is called cation displacement. In this case, what will happen? I am taking the example of this barium titanate. The cations, the titanium. Oxygen, the cations are moved from the equilibrium position that give rise to phase transition. Another case is that called the octahedral tilting. Octahedral tilting means octahedra means in this case, it if I am taking a materials A B O three, it form the B O six octahedra. Look, this is called the octahedra. Octahedra means octa means eight phases are there. There will be B. This is the B atom is there. If you combine all these six oxygen. In this case, it will take BO6 octahedra. Means there are eight phases are there. What happens? The BO6 octahedra sometimes the phase transition may not govern the change in the uh, atomic displacement. There there may be the change in the uh, tilting of this octahedra. This octahedra may tilt along the same direction or, or along this different direction. That also give rise to phase transition. The best example is let us take I am taking a BO6 octahedra and these A atoms are there. If I rotate, in this case, what will happen? One is rotating 
clockwise and another is rotating anti clockwise due to this one what will happen the phase transition is being taking place in this case what will happen here the translational invariance is after this distance i am getting the symmetrical equivalent position but here i am getting the symmetrical equivalent position after this one that's why sometimes if you see whenever the phase transition is taking place that the doubling of this unit cell is, is being taking place if the doubling of the unit cell is taking place this is sometime where the octahedral tilting is coming into picture uh, those who are working with this uh, perovskite materials they must have gone through this uh, glazer's notation for the octahedral tilting those are very very fundamentals related to this octahedral another type of distortion is called the john taylor distortion all of you know this one in most of the cases of magnetic materials also this john taylor distortion is there so based upon this now i will come to my result some of my result before understanding what is happening in this one let us take what uh, happening in case of barium type all of you know barium type really are room temperature which is ferroelectric materials at room temperature the structure is tetragonal the point group is p4 mm whenever i heat it that one up to 120 degree it will go to cubic so let me start from the my discussion from a cubic if i take a cube if i decrease the temperature below 130 degree the cube become tetragonal in the cubic phase the polarization is equal to zero that is in the paraelectric phase and in this case the polarization direction is along the c axis that's why what i see during the hierarchy of the symmetry i see i saw you that if i have a cube if i drag it along the c direction i will get the tetragonal if i am dragging it along the c direction what i am getting i am getting the polarization along the c direction this means that in this case the distortion is taking place along the c direction so that the phase transition is being the polarization is occurring along the c direction then again i decrease the temperature this is going from orthorhombic from tetragonal to orthorhombic how how you can go what you can do you can if i drag it this tetragonal along this b direction this means that from with respect to this unit cell what is happening we are dragging with respect to b and we are dragging with respect to c so that what will happen whatever the direction we will get the direction will be along this 1 1 1 direction sorry 1 1 0 direction along this one phase so in this case the polarization will be developed along this phase again if we decrease the temperature in this case the distortion is just like a rhombohedron the rhombohedron means from a cube if i drag it along this 1 1 1 direction this will become rhombohedral so in this case the polarization direction will be along 1 1 1 direction so from cubic to tetragonal tetragonal to orthorhombic rhombo orthorhombic to rhombohedral up to this one cubic to tetragonal tetragonal to orthorhombic they are obeying the hierarchy of the symmetry path means if i have a cube cube to tetragonal tetragonal to orthorhombic directly you cannot go from cube to orthorhombic any phase transition all these phase transition if there is a second order phase transition type and type uh, transition always they will follow the group theoretical calculation path this means they will go from cube to tetragonal tetragonal to orthorhombic so if you do some experiment these are some lattice parameters in rhombohedral all of you know only one parameter is sufficient to describe in, in orthorhombic this two par three parameter a b c and in tetragonal a c and in or cubic this is the c parameter by doing this experiment also we are getting the same phase times actually what is happening in this case of phase times all of you know whenever there will be a for the representation of any unit cell we need the y cup position y cup position this is called the fractional coordinates if i decrease the temperature what will happen this oxygen whatever the oxygen will be there the oxygen has been represented 0 0.5 0.0 0, 0 0.5 at the half 0 0 position this this position this 3c position that has become splitted into two different position here also it will Hello, is there some problem? Dr. Pradhan, 
Are you there? Dr. Pradhan? Yes, there was a little bit of networking problem. Okay, I'm joining. Okay. You join from browser. My screen is visible now. No, 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 no. Please join. Join your browser. Join from your browser. It is screen is there. Join from browser. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now it's coming. Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. So Now I'll try to explain you one of this, uh, as I told one of my master students did this work in this case. Although in classical textbook, what we read that we read that in case of very phase transition for barium tightness, the titanium ion is moving that give rise to phase transition, but, but actually that is not the case. Along with this titanium ion, the oxygen ion, the barium ion, all of them are moving from one, one or other direction. The movement or the correlated movement or the collective movement of these atoms that we are defining in, the, in terms of symmetry term as a mode. Whenever there is a mode, how this mode is changing during this phase transition that gives rise to structural phase transition phenomena that is called the mode analysis. During this mode analysis, we have calculated some mathematical calculations. And we have put that one in a freely available server, server that is called the Bilbao crystallographic server. In that Bilbao crystallographic server, what we saw, we saw that by putting this one, this is our result. What we see, we see that there will be some movement of this barium. There is some movement of this titanium. There is two type of oxygen. One type of oxygen is called the basal oxygen between the two phases along the sea. This other oxygen is called, called the facial oxygen. And this movement, all this movement is giving rise to phase tension. So in this case, what will happen? The phase tension, whenever it is been taking place, that is based upon the symmetry mode. Mode means the collective movement of all these atoms give rise to phase tension. And whenever we combine all of them, we see that the, although the movement of the titanium ion for this phase tension is more, but still the movement of the other atoms is there that give rise to phase tension phenomena in case of uh, barium titanate. Now, this is called the Landau theory of phase tension. Whenever the phase tension is taking place, I'm giving the example from cubic to tetragonal. If the cubic phase is the high symmetry phase, 
the low symmetry phase is the tetragonal phase whenever they have been related there must be one active irreducible representation Now, am I audible? Now, uh, now it's okay. Okay, okay. Please do. Please show that uh, there is several uh, uh, is pages some, are open. There is some problem here because of there is fluctuate power fluctuation is there. So let me join it. Okay, okay. So please shortcut this presentation and complete. Uh -huh. I'll complete. I'll complete within five ten minutes. Already you have already there. So I think there is presentation because you your link is there, but only. Okay. So that means maybe there is you have joined several times with this link. So that's why discontinue. Now my it is visible. Screen is visible. Screen is not visible, but you join there. Now okay. it is visible. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's okay. 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 So now let us discuss about the size effect on the ferroelectric behavior. In this case, what will happen? Uh, there is a recent uh, thrust for development of the miniaturized solid state devices. That's why people are trying to decrease the size of this particle. Whenever there is a decrease in the size, how the size effect affecting the different ferroelectric behavior, that part we are going to discuss. In this case, mainly we'll try to discuss by decreasing the size, how it is changing. How it is changing the structural and vibrational properties, phase tension, curie temperature, and dielectric and polarization behavior, that part we will try to discuss. This is one of these example here, a group of people that prepare the barium diagram and the center it has temperature. They observe that with increase in the temperature, the previously it was cubic phase and finally it becomes tetragonal. The tetragonal means 
all of you will know the, for the cubic phase, the ferroelectric temperature, ferroelectric phase is not possible, but in case of tetragonal, the ferroelectric phase is possible. So with increasing the temperature means with increasing in the size, the ferroelectric property is become evolved. So if we take a matrix below a critical size, the ferroelectric property will not be possible. That part also we are doing some another experiment. That experiment is called the uh, differential scanning calorimetry. Whenever the differential scanning calorimetry will be there, if there will be a phase transition, the phase transition can be give rise to an endothermic peak. Whenever the size of this particle is 35 nanometer, we never get any type of phase transition. But whenever the size will be around 0.1 to 0.4 micrometer, then one phase transition is visible for higher materials for 10 micrometer size, we are, getting, we are able to get the both the phase transition. So with increasing the central temperature, the materials which is become cubic, that is changing to tetragonal phase. After that one, we have also calculated one parameter that is called the tetragonality. Tetragonality means C by A minus 1 into 100 or, or anything you can multiply. It has been observed that the tetragonality decreases with decrease in the grain size. This means that the ferroelectric property should decrease with decrease in the size. So how this how this ferroelectric properties should be related to this one the tetragonality because most of the cases whenever i am dis describing the tetragonal distortion by eta eta is related to k k is the electrostative coefficient and it is related to polarization if the tetragonal distortion will be more then the polarization will be more if a metal will become more tetragonal phase then it then 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 it will become more ferroelectric phase that is from this calculation we are seeing from, from the Raman spectroscopy also, what we observe, we observe that the characteristic modes and that mode is the characteristic mode corresponds to the tetragonal phase and in, in tetragonal phase, the phase, the materials become ferroelectric. If I decrease the size, what you see, if I decrease the size, if I decrease the temperature, this phase becomes disappeared. Similarly, if I decrease the size, what is happening with decrease in the size, you see this is the web number, we decrease in the size. Uh, the materials, the phase transition temperature, that is become decreases. So the size also affecting the phase transition behavior. Here, what I wanted to tell, I measured the tra transition temperature with respect to different size. If the size, let us take, I'm taking the example for lead titanium, if the size will be above 50 nanometer, the phase transition temperature will not affect by increasing the size. But if the phase, if the lead titanium I'm taking, if I decrease the size, if the size will be below something 15 to 20 nanometer, you will see that this phase transition temperature disappear. This means that the ferroelectric property will be dis disappear. Although we know that at the nanoscale, the property will be more. But if you decrease the size of this particle below the critical temperature, what will happen? The property will be disappear. If the property will be disappear, this means that in this case, you have to make the balance that at what size the property should not disappear and you will, you will get the maximum property that we should look for. Finally, we did some work. Still, we are working with the barium tightness system because still some fascinating fundamental physics are there. We prepare these materials. We sinter it. Sorry, we calcine it at different temperatures. So we sinter it at different temperature. What we see, whenever we sinter it at 1000 degrees centigrade, we, this is become cubic phase. But whenever we increasing the centering temperature, the tetragonal splitting is there, and this tetragonal splitting gives us that we at a critical temperature, at a critical temperature, we are getting the ferroelectric. The tetragonal phase is evolving, and this tetragonal phase will give rise to the ferroelectric property. Let us see how the how the size is being changing. In this case, what is the size? The, yeah. the size of this particle is there. The, in, we, with increase in the size, the grain size is increasing. Similarly, what we see, we see that the dielectric constant increases with increase in temperature. With increase in temperature, the ferroelectric properties also increases. So what we see, we see that. The size, if the size will be decreases, the ferroelectric properties, the dielectric properties, the phase tension temperature, all these properties should decrease. But what is the mechanism behind that one? We explain this mechanism. We go for several literature. One literature based upon this Greek wall model, what they told. Whenever we have a system, let us we have a ferroelectric system, the grain is ferroelectric and the grain boundary is non-ferroelectric. The grain phase is high permittivity, the grain boundary is lower permittivity. In the nanoscale, as more number of particles they are residing at the grain boundary in the lower permittivity phase, that's why the ferroelectric properties and the dielectric properties are decreased. 
In other cases, when, what do we can explain? We can explain that the decrease in the dielectric constant is due to the lack of domain formation because the to get a relative property for domain formation is there. But the actual domain could not be formed at the lowest particle size of this relative material. That's why the dielectric constant decreases. And third one is <laughs> with the decrease in the size, the transition temperature also decreases. Why the transition temperature decreases? Because in case of nanocrystalline materials, the size effect is there. Due to the size effect, the polarization is changing. As the polarization is changing, that's why there is a decrease in the phase transition temperature. So how the polarization is giving rise to decrease in the phase transition temperature and why the polarization at below a critical temperature, why the polarization becomes vanishes. That can be explained by means of this figure. Let us, I have a ferroelectric materials. Here the ferroelectric lines of forces are there. And if I take a big domain, my big domain has this one. These are the my ferroelectric property. This is the polarization direction. If I'm going on decreasing the size, there will be more number of particles at the surface. And that particular size, due to this, this one, what will happen? The electrostatic energy due to the polarization that will increase and above a critical value, this polarization that will allow this, allow this total domain to disintegrate. Due to the disintegration, what will happen? A single domain will be there. In each domain, the polarization will be, will be cancelling out with, with each other. After cancelling out with each, with each other, the polarization will be disappeared. So what will happen? With decreasing the size, the properties will decrease. The, some ferroelectric properties below a critical size, below a critical size it will decrease. Above that critical size it will never decrease. But the, below that critical size, if you again decrease the particular size, all these ferroelectric ferroelectric property and dielectric property will disappear. So finally, what I can conclude, I can conclude that the particular size play an, play an important role, or for the ferroelectric to paralytic phase tension temperature, and the, the the dielectric constant, the dielectric property decreases with decrease in the size below a critical temp critical uh, size and finally the ferroelectric property below the critical size also decreases due to that one so to prepare materials all these parameters should be taken into consideration such that we should be preparing good ferroelectric materials finally these are the books or these are the literature i have followed uh, these are my research group and thank you all. thank you very much professor pradhan Thank you. Uh, this is now uh, time for the uh, participant questions. So please uh, ask questions to participant if he, you have any query for these things. Any questions? I think uh, there is no more questions. So uh, uh, there is a very small query of the regarding these things. Uh, mm -hmm. In 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 these ferroelectric materials, what is this? Mm -hmm. uh, this symmetry is okay, but mm -hmm. what about the strain? Because uh, whether strain. the strain effect is affected? Yes, to... yes, the strain is there. Strain effect mainly the, the strain effect is affecting. I didn't go directly to the strain. Because if the materials will be more strained, then only the free energy will be dominant over that one. That's why it will become disintegrated. The last part of the strain term I didn't utter, but the strain term is that is mainly disintegrating the materials. Below that critical size, the relative property is disappeared. Okay. Thank you very much. Any uh, more questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, now oh, okay. it is time to uh, thank you the uh, uh, speaker, uh, uh, Professor Dilip Kumar Pradhan. And uh, thank you very much. Okay, and uh, we are waiting for the next uh, session uh, in 12.15. Uh, so uh, uh, we are waiting for this another lecture. There is a Dr. Kanu Charan Barik. Uh, he is a, he is a scientific officer. Uh, uh, in uh, Bhava Atomic Research Center, he has very another very interesting topic of the synthesis and the surface engineering of oxide nanostructure uh, for the biomedical applications. So we should wait for some times, uh, half an hour. Uh, so when you will join, then we will start uh, from. Uh,
this session next session thank you very much okay, thank you okay. professor pradhan thank you uh, thank you very much. and uh, thank you the participants for the listening thank you
Thank you. Okay, uh, so now this uh, uh, speaker has arrived. Uh, I introduce uh, uh, Dr. Barik. Uh, Dr. Barik has uh, pursued his MAC from Utkala University and a PhD from IIT Bombay. Uh, in the Department of Metallurgical Engineering and Material Science. He has expertise with the, the biomaterials and uh, now he is uh, working with uh, Scientific Officer F in the chemi Chemistry Division, Bhava Atomic Research Center. And uh, today his talk uh, is uh, Synthesis and uh, Surface Engineering of Oxide in Unstructured the biomaterial applications. Uh, so I think uh, over two, and he has uh, lots of publication and over 77 publication with the age index 26. So it is over to uh, uh, Dr. Kanucharan Barik for his talk, industry talk. So let's uh, over to Barik. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Vibhu. So, good, good morning. So, am I audible to all of you? Yes, audible. Okay. So, today I'm going to talk on synthesis and surface engineering of oxide nanostructures for biomedical applications. So, mainly since it's an FDP program, so I will briefly discuss this. Uh, that my slides are changing, sir. Yes yes. yes, yes. Okay. So I'll briefly introduce the nanostructure material while I, where I will discuss the, the mainly what why the nano importance of nanostructure material and its some of its applications and then the basic concepts of uh, nanomaterials in terms of preparations and their surface functionalization, why it is important for biomedical applications. And then I will give some examples that uh, of our studies, especially on magnetic nanostructure as well as uh, some hybrid nanostructures and some other nanocarriers like zinc oxides, micelles or vesicles and their application especially I will discuss with the drug delivery, hyperthermia, cellular imaging and MRI. So mainly this will be focused on biomedical application of uh, nanomaterials. So coming into nanostructure material as you know when you go to the nanomaterials so there are three major parameters come into picture. So one is size effect, another is surface or interface effect, and third one is structural effect. So this, when you go to a smaller size, so you see the number of atoms, that number of atoms, surface atom will reduce. And because of that, you have a reduced lattice constant. And then another new phenomena coming into picture that is called quantum confinement. And because of that, your, you know, the drastically the nanomaterial says, different properties from that of a bulk counterpart. You can see here that left image here, the population of atom versus particle size. Here you can see how the surface atom, when you have a, a smaller size, how a surface atom is increasing and the corresponding bulk atom is decreasing. So because of that increase in your surface at number of surface atoms, your property will change. And you can see the top right image that how the energy level it changes like from a bulk if you see a semiconductor you have a band gap when you have a molecule you have a homolomo separation but when you go for a nano size quantum dots that's a discrete energy level which lies in between a semiconductor and a molecule so that means the property is quite different from that of bulk counterpart and you can similarly you when you go to smaller size you introduce large of uh, large number of you know defects so that's mainly so this defect because of dangling bonds on the surface, broken bonds. So they come into picture and because of that, you know, lot of, you know, structural factor come into picture. You can see this icosahedral, that gold nanoparticle, which is less than five nanometer, that is icosahedral, but where bulk gold is FCC structure. See, the structural parameter is completely changed from a FCC structure to an icosahedral structure when you have a size is less than five nanometer. And similarly, that uh, is a lot of surface defects come into picture that because of that, you know, large surface energy and change in bond structure occurs. So because of these parameters, 
the change in this parameter will introduce you know new phenomena to the materials and you can see here you have a bulk gold film in this image right side bottom one you see bulk gold film is yellow in color when you go to size about 30 to 500 nanometer is slightly blue and then it slowly changes to 3 to 30 nanometer it is red color and finally when you go to a less than one angstrom it is colorless so these properties that optical properties changes because of the size effect and similarly if you see how the properties changes of the nanomaterial if you go to thermodynamic property that melting point is drastically decreases you can see this is a melting point of gold that i have shown here in the graph that red curve you can see when you have a radius of particle of 10 nanometer your melting point lies in 900 degree centigrade but you go down to three to four four nanometer it's, it starts decreasing at a below two nanometer it's even less than 300 or 250 degree centigrade so that you know the drastically change in the melting points and similarly the phase transition temperatures like you can see some structure which undergoes fcc to vcc transition or some other transition so those uh, you know transition temperature will also change that because of large fraction of surface atoms similarly if you go for a catalytic properties you see the surface activity changes and because of that so that uh, catalytic property of a edge of a nanoparticle or a small corner you will see so they are more active than a bulk counterpart so the activity the catalytic activity also increases when you have a small nanoparticles for example it says that gold nanoparticles shows some catalytic activity which bulk does not similarly if you go for a mechanical and electrical properties that is also and uh, there's enhancement in mechanical strength for example if you go for carbon nanotube and you compare to steel the carbon nanotubes you know mechanical strength is much much higher than that of steel similarly if you go to electrical conductivity that it decreases with a reduced in dimension like for example if a electrical material you see you know a, a ohmic relation in the iv cuff when you go down the single atom it looks like a, you know it behaves like an insulator because there will be columbic blockade will come into contact there will be no you know atoms are separated if they are single single atoms so there will be no tunneling effect so you will get you know electrical conductivity also decreases similarly if you go for the optical properties the optical properties that band gap changes when you have a smaller in size so that band gap is proportional to you know one by r square the radius of the particle is a, in exponentially decay curve you will see if you go for a um, band gap with radius of the particle and because of that you know the you can see in this image how the color of the solution like of a quantum dust changes from blue and from red to blue when you have a you know size decrease in case of magnetism you will see a new property come into picture that is if a bulk magnetic material is generally ferromagnetic or ferrimagnetic in nature when you go for a smaller nano size particle you will see that uh, you know most of the domain wall in the magnetic material that that uh, that will be you know no domain walls you will get you know single domain particles each particle will be single domain you will ended up with a new properties called super paramagnetism so these are the few properties that thermodynamic properties optical properties magnetic properties electrical mechanical as well as catalytic properties changes when you have a bulk you go from bulk to a nanomaterials so because of this change in properties you know uh, produce lot of interest among the researchers to you know in, in be involved in this type of research and find their potential application in different fields so when you go to synthesis of nanostructure that this nanostructure can be synthesized in two ways one is top down method that old technology that from a bulk material you create thin film heterostructure and quantum dots by you know cutting down from bigger to smaller by lithographic techniques or ball milling or by attrition by the physical processing way you can decrease from a bigger size to a smaller size by approach by top down approach similarly that you can this is mainly physical processing but you can also create nanoparticles by chemical processing from atom to nanocrystal like you can structure these molecules by atom by atoms 
molecule by molecules or cluster by cluster in a solution phase synthesis or in a uh, vapor phase synthesis where you can create a small nuclei and then you grow the nuclei to from atom to a nanocrystals. So this technology is mainly you can synthesize by you know, liquid phase or vapor phase synthesis. So I'll discuss mainly that uh, liquid phase synthesis, how you will create this nanoparticles by different you know, solution approach, because that is mainly, you know, you can easily, you know, manipulate the structure of the material and its size by solution phase rather than in a vapor phase method. So when you go for a synthesis of nanoparticles, the two picture come in, uh, comes into play. So first thing is nucleation and second thing is growth. The nucleation will initiate first and then it slowly grows to a particular size. And this process goes through three different steps. That is first, you have a solution. When you have a solution, you have to go to the super saturation of the limit of the uh, molecule of the material that you want to synthesize like for example if you synthesize fe 3 4 your iron concentration iron salt concentration uh, of should be higher than the super saturation first you have to reach to the super saturation zone and then at the super saturation with particular temperature pressure or in particular condition you, the nucleation will start and then the nucleation will grow to form a nanoparticle so this is a thermodynamic approach so if you see the growth of a nanoparticle, the formation of nanoparticle is thermodynamically unstable because the nanoparticle has, you know, delta G is positive in this case. So if a bulk nano bulk material, you will see the delta G is negative. So that is stable. You can see this free energy curve on the left side that you can see that free energy was a radius. The top one, you can see that the black one is interfacial energy. That when you synthesize particle, two energy coming into picture. One is your surface energy that is interfacial energy, that is 4 pi r square into surface tension gamma. And then another is volume free energy, that is 4 by 3 pi r q into delta G v. So these two parameters will come. Surface energy is always positive, and your delta G, that uh, free energy, volume free energy is negative. So then you will end up with the resultant of that, you know, green color curve, that is it's go on increasing the positive, and then it's go to negative scale. So you can see when you have a R star, that is a, uh, that is a maxima of the radius. If the, that is the radius beyond this that the R star, it is not unstable. Once your nucleation form, it again goes back to the solution when the radius of the particle is less than R star because their delta G is positive. But when you go to R star is, R is greater than R star in the positive axis, in that case, it is still unstable. But when you go to the uh, negative axis that to down that R star is greater than that uh, R. So you, it is positive, but it's changed to the bulk kinetics here. But this is the zone that uh, from R star to the X axis where it touches that green curve. This is the uh, first one that, uh, that this curve. So there it's mainly, you know, the delta G is positive, but we make it is thermodynamically unstable. We make it kinetically stable by using some coating agent like surfactant molecules or polymers, those particles will go and stick, those molecules go and stick to the nanoparticle surface and it will further prevent the growth of the nanoparticle and you will be able to get a stable nanoparticle. So for getting a stable nanoparticle, you have to make it kinetically, you know, kinetically approach, you have to make it by using some sort of coating or some, you know, uh, polymer agent that you have to bind. So mainly, and then the growth process occurs after the nucleation. So the growth is mainly diffusion from the bulk to the surface. Once the nucleation starts, so that nuclei act as a seed, and further, instead of further nuclei, the precursor molecule go and stick on that nuclei and it grows. So they mainly this is that uh, that is a hom homogeneous reaction where that nanoparticle that grow uniformly and you will get ended up with a highly monodispersed nanoparticle. But if you have a heterogeneous, there is a, a substrate on which you want to grow. In that case, you will end up with a different size of nanoparticle. Mainly for any biomedical application, you need the size to be highly monodispersed. That means there's uniform size and then it should have specific you know, surface chemistry. The specific molecule on the surface that make it collateral stable. It should be stable in aqueous medium or is stable in physiological medium or in biological body fluids. So in order to that, you have to use some capping agent to make them stable and soluble in the 
non structure so if you give, go this kinetic approach you can see how you can get a uniform size particle so all particle has to nucleation at same time so that means the nucleation is to be fast process it should not be a slow process once you add your reagent that catalyst the nucleation will start and it's immediately it should you know go to the support saturation limit and then you will able to get that uh, to prevent the further growth of the nanoparticle and you will, you will get a homogeneous particle but if you have a slow growth in that case that you will be have chances that there is instead of growing the same particle some more nucleation can generate and you will end up with a different size of particle so mainly the limiting amount of precursor for both for growth confining in a limited space like you have to use that the precursor and the catalyst has to be controlled in such a way that you will end up with a you know uniform sized particles so mainly that that i have discussed the two different categories of nucleation on heterogeneous and homogeneous nucleation and homogeneous you know nucleation randomly occurs away from the surface whereas heterogeneous mainly occur on a surface on a seeded molecule on a seed and these two approach is used for a synthesis of nanomaterials so uh, this nanoparticle can be synthesized in two ways one is vapor phase synthesis another is liquid phase synthesis in vapor phase synthesis what you do we have to synthesize by you know evaporate the material and then sublimate to get a particular size a particular structure or specific phase of the molecule of the nanoparticles but uh, but in liquid phase synthesis what you do we play everything in a solution here so here the See precursor and it goes to an intermediate nuclei and then the primary particles will generate the nucleation will start and you end it with the nanoparticle or nano cluster or agree agglomeration occurs and if there is agglomeration you will get a cluster of particles if you grain growth uniformly then you'll end it with a highly monodiscus particle and then see here you can use different synthesis method i just briefly introduced them one is colloidal precipitation method where you can synthesize the nanoparticle by using a precipitating agent for example you will take a, a for synthesis of zinc oxide you can take zinc precursor and add some potassium you know, hydroxide or NaOH and you will able to get at 90 degree around you will able to get at a precipitation of zinc oxide from zinc acetate or zinc nitrate precursor or even you can synthesize f 3 o 4 by using ammonia adding you know plus 2 plus 3 both the salts so it's a colloidal or precipitation method which mainly occur below 100 degree centigrade in aqueous medium but when you but in aqueous medium this particle here in colloidal or precipitation method it's very difficult to control the size of the nanoparticle because it's a slow process and it's a very you know temperature is quite low it's a, it's, a, it's 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 not possible to control the size of the particle but if you go to the polyol method that is mainly that using organic solvent like ethylene glycol polyethylene glycol or di or triethylene glycol there in the high boiling solvent you can able to synthesize some sort of you know a little bit monodisperse particle in this case similarly in sol gel method if first you have to prepare a sol for it, then you will get a gel like for example silicon nanoparticle if you prepare by using you know initially you using tetraethyl ammonium tetraethyl orthosilicate you have to take teos and then by adding ammonia or ethanol media will able to get a, a sol solution with time it form a gel then you will be able to get a it's nanoparticle method. But if you go for a high temperature synthesis, like when a synthesis temperature is more than 280 or 260 degrees centigrade, a such a high temperature using organic precursor like acetate, acetate acetyl acetonate, or those janthate, those type of organic molecules, salt you will take in organic salt, and then it is such a high boil in a high boiling solvent like benzyl ether, dibenzyl ether, or phenyl ether. You at temperature of around 280 or 270 degrees centigrade, you will able to produce highly monodispersed particle. Even standard deviation of the particle is less than you know three nano, less than three percent. You will able to achieve in this by thermal decomposition method. Similarly, you can synthesize your nanoparticle in a salbothermal or hydrothermal. That where you can use that you know by applying external pressure by under pressure you can synthesize those those nanoparticles also and you can also synthesize them in a sonochemical method by where you can use you know ultrasound energy in stimulator 
for the synthesis of you know nanoparticles at the, when the ultrasound you apply a solution the temperature goes to around 6000 kelvin at such such temperature your bubble collapse and you will able to get you know nanoparticles you can also synthesize by micro microwave assisted by using microwave you can synthesize your nanoparticles so mainly so the synthesis methodology play a key role in controlling the shape size and polydispersity of nanoparticle if you choose a perfect synthesis method and you will able to end up with a highly monodispersed nanoparticles because uh, because that's you need for your real application in biomedical field so at the same time you have to choose a method which is a simpler process low cost and you know it's a high yield you see when you synthesize nanoparticles the you know yield is quite low so you have to choose the method where you can slightly improve the yield like when able to get a few gram if possible but mostly it's quite difficult synthesizing in large scale production of nanoparticles but you batch wise you can achieve that so if you compare the synthesis method i have just shown that key properties of different method like that i have shown here that you know co-precipitation is very simple and your temperature is quite low and you will able to get you know yield is quite high but your size distribution is not that good as well as safe you can't control but you can go to thermal decomposition you can see it's little complicated organic solvents are involved and uh, uh, high boiling solvents and but reaction temperature is quite high it is little bit tedious but you have a very narrow distribution and uh, you know you can control the size uh, and as well as your yield is very high so depending up, upon your application and your requirement you can select a particular method and you can see here the three different nanoparticles I have shown here. Left one is a synthesized co precipitation method. Here you can see these nanoparticles are you know highly aggregated. But the right two image, and you can see the nanoparticles are highly monodispersed, well separated, because they are synthesized by organic using organic solvent and high boiling medium at thermal by thermal decomposition process. So once you synthesize the nanoparticle, the next step is to stabilize this nanoparticle in the cure media to, to get them, you know, for the application point of view. So the nanoparticle, you know, is a small size. They have a high surface energy and high surface area. So a highly active surface. So they try to, you know, conjugate each other, they come together to reduce the overall free energy, overall surface energy and to form a cluster. So you have to prevent that to make them highly more uh, stable in, an, uh, in a specific medium. Like mainly since we are going for biological application, we will make them in phosphate buffer saline or culture media, cell culture media, it has to be stable. And for that, you're, you, have to, the, you have to play with the surface chemistry of these nanomaterials. So by using different surface specificating agent, like capping with ligands, that can further growth of the nanoparticle as well as prevent their aggregations. Okay, so okay, so uh, if if there is any doubts, you can please ask in between also. Okay, so uh, is it clear so far that synthesis of nanoparticles? Yes, sir. Please carry on. Uh, okay. In the end of uh, this talk, we have sufficient time to give for. Uh, okay, no problem. Thank you, sir. So once your nanoparticle is synthesized, so now you have to functionalize with particular molecules. So surface modification of nanoparticles help us to tune their properties to suit different applications. So uh, you have to introduce a surface molecule to the nanoparticle to make them stable. And it, it also helps in getting biocompatibility. When you go for a biomedical application, your particle should not have toxic effect. So there should not be any inherent toxicity of the materials. So in order to reduce the toxicity and to provide biocompatibility, this coating is required. Another one is site-specific targeting. Once you synthesize your nanoparticle, you want for a particular application. So for, for example, if a cancer therapy, you have to target that nanoparticle to the tumor site. So tar for targeting, you need a specific molecule on that surface. So that molecule can be conjugated on the particle surface by you know, uh, modifying the surface by playing with the surface structure. And at the same time, it provides collodial as well as chemical stability to the nanoparticle. And also, you can find different drug molecules 
fluorescent molecules or any biomolecules to the nanoparticle surface by using surface modification method. You can see here that nanoparticle can be stabilized by two ways. If the left image, it will see. So first, you can stabilize by electrostatic repulsion. For example, if you have a nanoparticle that is positively charged and you, you can create it either positive or negatively charged. So depending on the charge, positive, positive repulsion or negative, negative repulsion, the nanoparticle is stable in the solvent or the, in the media. But other way, by using you know long chain polymers or surfactant molecules so that will give steric repulsion between the two nanoparticles and you will be able to get a highly you know stable suspension but in these nanoparticles you can also introduce many many functionality like imaging agents site specific targeting moiety you know cell penetrating agents so when you go for a particular cellular application you have to introduce a specific molecules like the peptides those can be helps them to target to the specific site or you can conjugate different drug molecules so by by this nanoparticle is act as a carrier on that you can introduce you can conjugate different moieties or different molecules you know, of your requirement and then you can able to get uh, you know specific application if you go to the surface functionalized from nanoparticle you can see here i have just shown few examples this nanoparticle surface, they can be end grabbed with a PEG molecule that iron oxide core I have taken and PEG molecule is conjugated on the particle surface. Now see, the PEG is a long chain polymer. So that PEG has a lot of, you know, o oxygen molecule in between. So those oxygen molecule will help in, you know, hydrogen bonding with water. And then uh, there may, that helps also additional stability to the nanoparticles. And similarly, you can coat, coat it chitogen, dextran or polyethylene imines which is a negatively charged molecule pei so that will create a negative surface and by electrostatic stabilization you can make them stable or you can use different lipids phospholipids or copolymers to make them colloidally stable if you see that there is two main approach for, for, for functionalizing the nanoparticle that's one, one is covalent approach one other is non-covalent approach so in covalent approach you have to use some short chain linker molecules like, for example, dopamine, which has a OH group that easily binds with the nanoparticle surface, and you have an amine molecule that will be free for the colloidal stability. And dimercaptosoxinic acid, PG, mercaptosoxinic acid, those type of molecule you can easily bind on the particle surface, or you can use by simple, you know, silica coating by salinization, and you can make them, you know, colloidally stable. But in case of non-covalent interaction, you have to use either hydrophobic forces or electrostatic interaction for example if a nanoparticle have been ended with a hydrophobic tail you can introduce another hydrophobic molecule on the top surface so they because of hydrophobic hydrophobic between the two tail of the surfactant molecules you can able to make them you know stable systems or you can use different block copolymer or, or you can use you know polyelectrolytes or charged molecules or cation anionic surfactant like sds surfactant so in C tab molecules, so yeah, C tab is positively charged, SDS so dodecyl sulfate, sodium dodecyl sulfate is negatively charged. So those type of you know surfactant molecules can be introduced onto the particle surface to make them you know water dispersible. So if you see here, you can make this nanoparticle by conjugating citric acid, for so example, C tab, PG derivative, silica, micelles, or phospholipids, or even DNA on the cell. You have a nanoparticle with different organic cells on the surface and you can make them highly aqueous stable so if you but for for this for making this water dispersible or biomedical um, point of view you need minimum two functional group on the particle on the molecule which you want to conjugate on the nanoparticle if a magnetic nanoparticle that i have shown that you have at least two functional group for example you can simply take a, a diacids a pg diacid or succinic acid or RDPK, see that both two COH group. So one COH group can bind to the particle surface and another COH group will be free for conjugation of your drug or biomolecules or your receptors 
You can see if you have an NH2 molecule, you can use the simple chemistry of anhydride or epoxide and you can further conjugate a molecule. For a carboxyl, you can introduce EDC NHS coupling reaction, like amine group of a biomolecule can conjugate with a carboxyl coated nanoparticle. So, by different way, you can function like, like azide, sulfuridyl. So, you can manipulate the particle surface, even with charged surface, hydrophobic surface, and you will be able to get, you know, highly stable nanoparticles. So, if you see, the different nanoparticle surface ligand in literature, you will find gold that's highly coated with the thiols, disulfides, amines, quantum dust, mostly phosphine, pyridine, or thiol, those type of coated magnet nanoparticle, mostly that carboxyl, amine, those type of functional group can easily introduce on the particle surface and make them different applications. Like, see, they're widely different, like MR imaging for biomolecular magnet nanoparticle, for sensing for quantum dots, and biomolecular recognition <coughs> for gold even it used for sensing application. So you have a different application from ranging from imaging to therapeutic to sensing by using this type of functional molecule on the particle surface. So we are mainly interested on magnetic nanoparticles uh, for biomedical application. That is because, the, because of magnetic nature, you can use them magnetically dog targeting. And then since magnetic can use them MRI, magnetic resonance imaging. And also by magnetically, you can separate it separate the molecules or by cell sorting you can do that uh, you can conjugate the nanoparticle with a specific molecule and bind to the specific cells and through the external magnet you can separate from the mixture of different cells and then it's magnet nanoparticle also huge and hypothermia that heat activated killing of cancer cell at slightly elevated body temperature 42 43 degrees centigrade the cancer cell dies where normal cell can survive so by using because of this type of many multiple application, we are mainly focused on various magnetic nanoparticles. So now I will discuss a little bit our work. So we have developed magnetic nanoparticle and mainly for biomedical application, especially for drug delivery, hypothermia, and MRI imaging. So if you see here, you have created nanoparticles and have a surface functionality on that surface. And then we introduce drug molecules on the particle surface by electrostatic binding the some drug molecules they are they have a you know positive or negatively charged so if you create a negatively charged surface and then you can easily conjugate a positively charged drug molecules to the particle through electrostatic interaction similarly you can use a covalent approach like for example you have a hydrogen bond you have a coh and nh2 edc conjugation or uh, some uh, other way that aldehyde groups immune reaction you can do so you can conjugate drug and nanoparticles say functionalized nanoparticle by covalent approach or even hydrophobic interaction you can see here that this hydrophobic interaction one layer of organic molecule this is another layer of organic molecule on the top surface and in between that yellow particles are there so these are the drug molecules that i have shown here so they can conjugate in the hydrophobic layer or you can use combination of both the approach or multiple approaches like covalent electrostatic and combine you can combine with electrostatic with hydrophobic so you can introduce multiple drugs by combination of this uh, uh, binding approaches because when you go for a particular like for cancer therapy some cells used to be built up with you know multi drug resistance so they will resistance to a specific drugs so you for to overcome that you have to go for a multiple drug targeting for that you have to use multiple approaches to functionalize them. So I'll discuss one example here that we have used peptide as a cell material for functionalizing nanoparticle. You can see this is an F3 for nanoparticle, which was synthesized by co-precipitation method that I have discussed. Mm -hmm. On that surface, we introduced first layer is a glycine molecule. You can see COH, CH2, NH2. That's first a glycine molecule which conjugated on the nanoparticle surface, that carboxyl is conjugated on the nanoparticle. F3 O4 and NH2 is free. On that NH2 molecule, we simply play with surface chemistry by using different organic reaction, like what we use here, Michael Addison emidation reaction, like COH and that NH2 can easily bind with a, that acetyl group. So, so you use a in between cross linker and then by using Michael Addison emidation reaction, they have created, you see the multi layer organic structures. So we have ended with a structure which is like a peptide. We use arginine, glycine, and then second molecule is arginine. 
and in this way we have created a multi-layer dendritic structure you can see the end group is now coh and nh2 so we have a both coh and nh2 coh will give negatively charged where nh2 will give give positively charged so you have a depending upon the ph of the system you can you have a charge tunable characteristic a low ph the coh will be you know uh, that uh, low ph ns3 will be ns2 will be ns3 plus whereas high ph coh will be co minus so by that you can control the surface charge also so because of that so you, since you have charged molecule on the surface you can easily bind drug molecules by electrostatic interaction or you can entrap these drug molecules in between this pore structure of the dendritic structure or even covalently you can bind drug molecule to this coh or ns2 group and this functional exterior is make this nanoparticle in hydrophilic in nature and second thing you can see when you have a cancer cell uh, with this magnetic nature you can target them by magnetically to the cancer cell by using external magnet and then that with relatively low ph of the tumor that as you know tumor has you know high lactic acid secretion because of that uh, abnormal metabolism so that will give slightly acidic environment to the extracellular ph stimulate the charge characteristic of positive to negative and your bound drug molecule release that i will discuss to the uh, specific sites so you can see so after synthesis the nanoparticle you have studied their colloidal properties magnetic properties drug loading characteristics and see their cellular internalization or mri or hypothermia behaviors so we have thoroughly characterized these molecules so by different techniques that i will discuss how you can see now you see the characterize the nanoparticle by using different sophisticated techniques if you see once you prepare a nanoparticle the first step is to see whether the phage is successfully formed or not whether that we have seen this as f3 o4 whether the f3 o4 phage is formed or not for that we have proved by simple x-ray diffraction technique and see is the xrd curve on the left side you can see the six characteristic peaks it's mainly showing that my f3 o4 structure is formed so once you confirm that pore is formed, the next step is to see whether the cell structure is successfully formed or not. For that, we use TGA or element analysis or thermal analysis, like your FTIR for your transfer infrared spectroscopy, IR spectroscopy technique to confirm whether that structure is formed or not. Like you have a pore at F3O4 pore, pore and you have an organic cell. So you have to confirm whether both structure is formed, so the phase is formed, and then the surface chemistry is successfully you have introduced or not. You can see here in the FTR image that the bottom one is maybe the glycine coated particle, the first layer. And once you go on increasing the like multiple layers, that we are introducing different amino acids, that NH2 group is and by COH amide bonding. So you can see the vibration related to the COH at about 1600, uh, 1586, or 1665, you can see the top one that peptide coated magnetic nanocarrier PMNC. You can see the how the additional vibrational bonds are introduced. So that's mainly the formation of, you know, you can see in the structure, like lots of CONS, CONH are in between there. Once you have a multiple amide linkage, so you can see the how this additional bond characteristic is coming. And this is the lower at around 588, as a few vibration is there. So that is showing a P3O4 and this is showing my successful formation of organic layer. You can see with TGA, we have seen that with different layer, four layer I have shown here, you can see the weight loss is increasing. So that means more and more organic molecule is attaching. And since you are introducing amino acids, that nitrogen content is also increasing by CH and carbon hydrogen nitrogen analysis. So that indicating my cell is successfully formed. So once the cell and core are formed, so next step was to see whether the nanoparticle size as well as their colloidal stability. You can see here, this is a TM micrograph image. You can see these nanoparticles are about 10 to 12 nanometer in size. And that high resolution image clearly shows this highly crystalline nanoparticles. And it's a further confirming the formation of fp 3 4 structure from lattice from that uh, interplanar spacing that 0.3 nanometer that indicate that uh, the particular phase is formed. And then you see here that the colloidal stability, you can see that uh, the pH 2 to pH 10, my nanoparticle is highly stable. And in different medium like water, 1% NaCl, that is simple saline, then phosphate vapor saline, or DMEM, just cell culture media, that, that you know, in all these mediums, my nanoparticle are highly stable. 
and then you can see that the jitter potential surface charge at low pH due to SC5 is positively charged, at high pH is negatively charged. So what do you use? We, we have to use this high pH, that one at pH 7, 7.5 is negatively charged. And then we introduced a positively charged drug molecule of anti-cancer drug to their surface and you at low pH, which is that illustrating interaction between drug and molecule, drug and particles reduced and uh, by help that that's why the drug is getting released to the particular location. You can see in the hydrogen diameter that we measure that when you go for an intravenous injection, the nanoparticle has to pass through the blood capillary. So our blood capillary are about uh, 200 to 300 nanometer, you know, uh, nanometer in diameter. So this nanoparticle that is about 30 to 50 nanometer, the hydrogen diameter, the particle with organic coating. Hydrogen diameter means that nanoparticles with surface coating agent and organ and that hydrated water molecule on the surface whole thing is less than 50 nanometer so you can use them you know intravenous applications so once the nanoparticle is successfully formed core and cell is characterized then we introduce the drug molecule that we have taken doxorubicin hydrochloride that is anti cancer drug broadly used for many cancer like uh, cervical cancer breast cancer uh, liver cancer which have well, is a broad spectrum anti-cancer drug doxorubicin hydrochloride that is a positively charged drug molecule that you have taken and then we introduce that drug molecule through illustrating interaction with our negatively charged the peptide coated nanoparticle you can see here when you have a peptide coated nanoparticle it's minus 22 millivolt in the surface charge once you conjugate these drug molecules on the particle surface that is positively charged you see minus 22 to minus 5 that is drastically you know uh, increase in jitter potential from minus 20 to minus 5 that indicating the illustrating interaction between the drug and the particles is there is conjugating through interaction and then you have, we have characterized that uh, drug loading percentage by using fluorescence spectroscopy you can see the top red one is the fluorescence spectra of your drug whenever drug conjugated with nanoparticle so you separated the drug conjugated nanoparticles by magnetically and whatever the supernatant is there so that we have taken the reading that the fluorescence observed fluorescence reading and you can see here it's the it's decreases that indicating that drug molecule is getting conjugated on the nanoparticle surface and we have actually achieved at about 80 percent loading efficiency a drug to particle ratio of one is to ten so mainly this drug is successfully conjugated on the nanoparticle surface and then we have in, investigated their interaction with protein once your drug molecule conjugate to nanoparticle you want to introduce into the body your body has a lot of protein so with protein, this nanoparticle will conjugate and is form a protein corona on the nanoparticle. And instead of you know moving further, it can stuck in between the blood capillary. So to, to, for that aspect, we have been, we have studied that interaction of the BSA protein with this nanoparticle. It's a model we have taken, and we have seen there is no interaction between drug and protein, indicating that our system can successfully you know target to the particular site. So once your nanoparticle formed and drug is conjugated our next step was to see whether this nanoparticle are going inside the cell or not because that is the optimum aim that this nanoparticle with the drug molecule has to go to the target site and drugs to be released at the particular uh, location for that we have two, two techniques we have used one is confocal microscopy you can see here that we have used different dye molecule that blue is that uh, nuclei staining dye dapi and this is green red is your Doxorubicin, the drug molecule used, and like green is lysosome, that lysotracker, to identify whether the drug is going to the lysosome or not. So overall image, you can see here, the drug molecule is mainly on the cytoplasm, because you can see that blue, it, that P is clearly indicating it's on the outer side of the nuclei. So it's indicating that drug is going inside the cell, and it's mainly located in the cytoplasm. It is further confirmed by flow cytometric analysis. You can see when you have a drug with nanoparticle, that means comparison to control your signal intensity in x-axis, you can see that significantly shifted that flows in intensity. So that indicating that good cellular interlacing of our drug molecules inside the cells. So once it's going inside the cell, next to see whether this drug loaded nanocarrier is capable to release the drug molecule inside the cell or not. So for that, we have mimic a laboratory condition that pH 4, that is the intracellular, that is the lysosome endosome pH of tumor versus a physiological pH that you can see here, the drug is characteristic with time, 
that pure drug you can see within a fraction of two hours 100% drug is released but when you have a drug with nanoparticle we have a sustained and slow release over a period of 50 hours because you need a sustained on demand slow and control release of drug molecule inside the body instead of a fast release so you can see at the way tuning the ph 4 and 5 you can easily able to release this drug molecule so we establish a mechanism you can see the drug yes the drug is negatively charged and this nanoparticle is positively charged at physiological ph because of illustrative interaction between drug and nanoparticle so they are conjugated once it's going inside the cell that illustrative interaction you know the inside the cell that lies with fast it nanoparticle with drug will go to endosome then lysosome and then to cytoplasm so once it go to lendosome or lysosome they are the ph is four or five at four and five ph our nanoparticle that co minus it's again it what will happen because of acidic pH it becomes COH so that negative positive interaction will reduce and drug will reach, reach there so this is the important uh, you know characteristic of a nano carrier mediated drug delivery at particular sites so then we have seen that pH 7.4 the release is very less less than 7 percent so that means in blood pH your drug inside the blood capillary so drug will be retained with the nanoparticle once it go inside the tumor cell then the drug will be released. So that is the, what we mainly cure for cancer therapy. And then we have seen with the, with the cancer cell line, cervical cell line, HELA cell, with respect to uh, toxicity of the drug and drug load nanoparticle. You can see here a two micromolar concentration. Our drug load nanoparticle retain substantial toxicity about 40 percent, you know, as, uh, viability and 60 percent cell killing. So that means that the, the toxicity of the drug is retained in this formulation. And then since which is magnetic in nature, so you can target by using external magnet that image you can see here. We have a solution here when you put an external magnet, the nanoparticle is getting separated. Once you remove the magnet, again it goes back to the solution. That is the important characteristic of these materials. And you can get you know good magnetic responsibility for targeted drug delivery. And IC50 of the drug is about uh, with formulation, is about two, two micromolar. So it is sufficient enough uh, for you know getting good. Uh, and cytotoxicity effect and then so uh, so this uh, this uh, anti that formulation that you developed and that formulation we have tested in mice model also so that i'm not uh, discussed today uh, here so with mice also we found that the drug formulation is showing good efficacy in treating in vivo you know tumor um, model that we have produced and then so so far what i have discussed the drug molecule is conjugated to the nanoparticle with the help of you know electrostatic interaction and electrostatic interaction that we have seen that drug molecule is getting released as a sustained and slow process in a period of 50 hours so here that we, we we mainly approach that magnetically drug targeting using external magnet but, but if your tumor is substantial in the, in the body and it's difficult to use external magnet in that case you can conjugate a specific you know receptor molecule to the particle surface and then you can target to the site by you know uh, the receptor mediated endocytosis process so for that aspect we create nanoparticles we prepare a free of nanoparticle co precipitation method and then you can see on the clinic acid it is 11 carbon chain coh and double bond here so coh is conjugated to the nanoparticle surface and double bond is free and to this double bond we have taken an amino acid cysteine which has a thiol group and the thiol that click in thiol click chemistry we, play here and we'll get it with a molecule with having NH2 and COH group again. And this NH2 group, we have conjugated a folate receptor, folic acid, we have conjugated to this here. And the COH is again we use illustratically for the drug binding. And we confirm their phase characteristic by different techniques, XRD and TM. You can see here we have a nanoparticle that is a double bond coated that is a hydrophobic one. You can see the nanoparticle in the organic phase. When you go to the cysteine coating, it's going to the water medium you can see in aqueous phase nanoparticle so you can tune the you know that that phase for organic phase to aqueous phase transformation by using this type of surface you know chemistry and then once the drug molecule is conjugated uh, i have not shown did all details data here so i've just shown you can see here the second image second row image you can see left fluorescent image that when you have a, a folic acid that signal intensity is high so that means that uh, when your folate receptor is there, we have taken a KB cell, that's a liver cancer cell, 
which is a folate over express cell. So that folate, KB cell over express the folate receptor. And to that folate receptor, this folic acid go and uh, bind there and uh, we are getting enhanced in close and intensity. You can see there is a throw for, with uh, flow cytometry analysis. We can see here the right image. There is a two when you have a dox with the um, folic acid conjugated nanoparticles and then higher uptake of this nanoparticle to every cell. And then you can introduce that pH mediated drug release there. So by this type of, you know, for this conjugating receptor molecule, you can target to the specific cancer cells uh, like uh, transferrin, you can conjugate, you can conjugate uh, the uh, specific peptides, and then you can target to the, uh, the particular cancer cells. So, uh, so, so far I have discussed with uh, illustrative conjugation of drug molecule that we have seen. The illustrative conjugation is of, uh, that the drug is released really in a slow and sustained period in a time frame of 50 hours. But if you go, you want for a longer time of release, uh, more than three days, five days, or a sustained and on demand, a slow, very, very slow release. In that case, you have to go for a covalent conjugation of drug molecules. For that aspect, what we have created a vitamin C, that ascorbic acid coated nanoparticle here. That to, to that we pledge on the surface chemistry by using you know two types of linkage one is carbamate linkage OCO NH one is hydrogen linkage NH N double one C so because of this hydrogen and carbamate linkage we conjugate again doxorubicin why we have chosen this type of linkage because they are acid labile means at low pH I pH five or four this type of linkage will break down so the drug molecule is released to the cancer cells. So in that way, so you can see here, the drug release is quite slow. Even, you know, uh, the period of 70 hours, you have only 25 to 30 percent is drug release, where in illustrative, we have achieved 100 percent release in 70, 50 hours. So that means it's 100 percent drug is not released here. So you can able to get a slow and sustained release by using this covalent approach that you can see here. It's a retained this toxicity of the, of the drug in different formulation like hydrogen or carbamate linkage. You can see of the four micromolar, the toxicity is about to 30 percent drug formulation has a viability and more than 70 percent toxicity you can achieve. And by confocal microscope, we have seen that drug molecule is to the nanoparticle. In addition to that, we have another property we have studied here that is that reactive oxygen species you know, protection against ROS. Since that um, the ascorbic acid, you know, it is a antioxidant. So coating of that will you know, it further supports, you know, it can um, passivate the killing of, you know, normal cell lines. So it will simultaneously it prevent the uh, normal killing of cancer cell, uh, killing of uh, normal cells, and it helps in killing of cancer cell by using this type of formulations. So in addition to other that, we have also created various phosphate coated nanoparticles, and then because you know our body has a lot of you know phosphate molecules are there so because of that we have introduced also phosphate coated nanoparticles even this pg coated nanoparticle we have created a different shape you can see cubic shape nanoparticle so here you have taken cubic shape because cubic you know anisotropic in nature because the anisotropy we have a higher magnetization and that we use to the magnetization characteristic for heat activated killing of cancer cell that i will discuss little later. So we have created different surface functionality by conjugating drug molecules to illustrative as well as a covalent approach. So in addition to that, also we have created, you know, highly monodispersed nanoparticle. You can see here, these are synthesized by uh, thermal decomposition method. And then you have an organic layer on the surface. This is olic acid or lauric acid on the surface. On that surface, we have created a pluronic P123, a block copolymer, PG-based block copolymer. You can see it has a hydrophobic uh, center and both hand you have a hydrophilic OH group. So it's a U-type molecule that both hydrophobic, uh, hydrophobic U, U bottom and the end, both end are hydrophilic. So what we, what we, do, we did here that you can see that hydrophobic, hydrophobic interaction. So you have created another layer on the surface and that interlayer we used for drug binding. But here we have taken hydrophobic drug molecule that is cancer agent that you also use, you know, multi-purpose like antibacterial, uh, 
antifungal or anti-inflammatory that you got to mean has a multiple you know characteristics so that you can see here yellow color dots that curcumin is introduced into the hydrophobic layer so if a hydrophobic drug molecule you can conjugate them by eating by hydrophobic drugs and you have seen that drug is getting released at ph 5 uh, is a quite high release 60 percent release in 50 hour whereas ph 7 release is less than five percent that means that a particular acidic tumor environment drug will release and you can see here the toxicity if you will see you can see a 30 and 50 micromolar toxicity of the formulation is higher than that of the drug because this curcumin is a hydrophobic drug when you have a formulation like hydrophilic formulation, the availability of the drug, the viability of the drug to the cell increases. So because of the enhancement of the viability of the drug, you are getting enhanced toxicity. So similarly, if you have a single drug, you can conjugate by hydrophobic interaction, you can create a hydrophobic interlayer, and then on the surface, you can create a, you know, um, positive or negatively charged surface, like here we have taken STS, sodium dodecyl sulfate, that is SO3 minus. So hydrophobic interaction, that CS3 group of oleic acid with CS3 group of HDS, they interact. And you can get an end group, that green one is a negatively charged. So here, that, posit, that the hydrophobic drug can be conjugated at the center, at the inner inner layer, and doxorubicin with the positively charged in the outer layer. So you have a two drug simultaneously you can target by using this type of you know, surface chemistry. And then we have investigated the toxicity as well as their conjugation efficiency. What do you found that when you have a a combined uh, toxicity so you will be able to uh, get high enhanced toxicity when you have a combination of drugs so in addition to the drug delivery since we are using magnet nanoparticle we have studied thermal therapy efficacy of this nanoparticle so thermal therapy that is also called uh, high magnetic hyperthermia so what does it means that under magnetic field this nanoparticle undergoes you know brownian and uh, nil rotation nil accession processes because of that random motion of the particle as well as the spin in the magnetic field, so that magnetic energy will lose as a converted to heat energy. And that heat energy is capable to rise the solution temperature to the local temperature of the particular body or particular area to 40 to 40 degrees centigrade, that where the cancer cell can die a normal cell can survive. So in that approach, you can see here, this IR thermogram that is a, and this is a coil image, you can see magnetic coil here, right side image. So you can see there is a center yellow zone that is your nanoparticle suspension. Then once you have switch on the magnetic field, you can see with time your temperature increase. So temperature goes to 40 to 43 centigrade, yes, times one more five to 10. In fact, we investigated using cancer cell that mostly they die at particular temperature. You can see this temperature is mainly specific to the particular location. So the side effect is quite less in case of this hypothermia mediated, you know, cancer cell death. And that approach you have seen with the cancer cell with hypothermia and chemotherapy where you have a combined drug molecules as a doxorubicin as well as a magnetic heat killing. You can see when a combination of drug and magnetic particle we have showing enhanced uh, toxicity in the last one that in the left curve you can see about uh, 25 to 30 percent toxicity of the combination we approach so this type of combination the therapy indicate higher cell death even at low concentration of drug molecules that synergistic effect you can be able to cre create and you can use them for hypothermia therapy and we have also investigated that uh, MRI properties of this nanoparticle, since it's a magnetic in nature, so we have investigated the magnetic resonance uh, properties of this F3 of nanoparticle. So in MRI, mainly two types of relaxation occur that we now all know, that one is T1 relaxation and T2 relaxation. So T2, that is spin-spin relaxation, and T1 is spin lattice. So spin-spin interaction is mainly, you can change that by using this magnetic nanoparticle. But T1 is mainly gadolinium based but T2 is specifically, though T magnetic nanoparticle shows some specific T1 characteristic also, but it's predominantly is a mainly a T2 relaxation here. You can see here, when I, I have seen here two comparisons. There's one is left image, TM image, you can see. It's an aggregated structure of about 50 nanometer, where a small, small six to seven nanometer particles, they aggregate to form an assembled structure. Right side is a small, you know, six to five nanometer particles. So I have compared both the nanoparticle for contrast property with a commercially available thermoxital that, that used for clinical studies. You can see here that when you have a 
particle, the relaxivity coefficient, the T2, is less than 196 millimole per second. It's quite less than that uh, nano assemblage. When you have a nano assemblage, there are multiple nano particles together that uh, will induce more, you know, relaxivity coefficient efficacy. You can see that color change. You can see what happens when you put a magnetic nano patient in an MRI that uh, our body has a lot of tissue molecules and the tissue are composed of nothing but water. And then this water uh, has, you know, a proton that is hydrogen is there. That hydrogen aligns with the magnetic field. When you put magnetic nanoparticle with that, that alignment process, that uh, the relaxation process, you can see in the next image, image that the T2 relaxation process, when you have a nanoparticle with the uh, magnetic nanoparticle with the water, the relaxation process is much faster. You can see because of, you can see that there is a single atom, that the T2 signal, you can see that this curve with the that blue signal is coming that mainly that low relaxation that relaxation process is quite slow when you have a assemble of nanoparticle relaxation process is fast mainly this magnetic nanoparticle helps in you know orientation this change that alignment of this water proton in the body very fast and because of that fast processing fast relaxation you will able to get a strong mr contrast and then you can able to identify if the tumor is there and you can be able to capable to low target to that tumor site by using specific receptor molecule with marine nanoparticle under mri you can easily diagnose the work yes here is the location of the tumor that can be identified by using this type of contrast change and then we have also created a structure using amino acid or glutamic acid where you can single platform we can track target and treat tumor simultaneously that means you can track them by using MRI, which is an MRI contrast agent that we create, that with the MRI you can able to track and target them magnetically and the same, or by using receptor molecule at the same time, you can treat them by using combination of that hypothermia as well as drug that chemotherapy. Okay, we have used here two drugs, simultaneously one methotrexate that we conjugate covalently and dox, doxorubicin we conjugate electrostatically. Here we have a combination of drug. So when you have a combination of drug that we have seen, the toxicity is much higher. And we combined with hypothermia with further synergistic effect we have able to see. We, we, we have seen that and then we can by, we have tracked that movement of the nanoparticle, you can track by using MRI contrast agents. So in addition to that tracking of the MRI using magnetic nanoparticle, you can also see by radio labeling this nanoparticle with the specific molecules like copper 64, we have target or lutetium 177, and you can sacrifice the mice after a particular time, and you can capable to see where that, uh, you know, all these drug molecules with nanoparticle is embedded in different organs. So if I have seen that even sufficient amount, we are able to get it. Specifically, it's mainly located in the liver because this is the um, immediately any foreign molecule will go and sit in the liver first. And then we are also getting little amount of the tumor. So that indicating that uh, our formulation is capable to, you know, uh, to see this type of long time, uh, this long term efficacy for cell healing. So in addition to that, fe 304 and for imaging purpose, like if you have a fluorescent molecule tagged to the nanoparticle, mainly organic molecule, so you can use them for you know identify the particular location also by fluorescent imaging. So, but this organic molecule dye, organic molecules, so they sometimes bleach the decompose after some time. So, for that aspect, we have conjugate europium dub YPO4 nanoparticle with magnetic nanoparticle. You can see it's a rice shaped YPO4 nanoparticle on the surface of coated silica, and then we introduce this right image, the TM image. You can see a picture of a nanoparticle embedded on the surface. So you have a, by EDC NHS coupling, we have conjugate these two, moieties, F304 and NH2. You can see here that you have a combined effect of magnetic, that this F304 gives you magnetic nanoparticle properties, and YPO4 will give you optical properties, the luminescence properties. By this combination of this hybrid structure, you can able to identify the location of the nanoparticle. You can see that, uh, that the luminescence properties mainly targeting that can blue one, which is nuclei, or green one is lysosome, and red one is your doxorubicin, that draw that sorry, red one is mainly here that luminescence property, the YPO4 that you conjugating when you overlap, you can see that nuclear staining agent this molecule by electron by mapping of the structures. 
Okay. So in addition, we have also investigated zinc oxide nanostructure for this type of application. You can see here, we have a uh, nano assemblage. We have created this nano by the diethyl glycol medium using zinc acetate as a precursor. We have synthesized ZNO nano assemblage. So these are nanoparticles of about 10 to 15 nanometer. They assemble to form a 200 to 300 nanometer assembly structure. And this assembly structure, the main important characteristic of this assembly structure is it's highly porous in nature. And at the same time, when you have a, you apply a sonic energy, ultrasonic vibration, this structure collapses. So that we use as a you know as a model to release to lower the drug molecules inside the porous structure of this assemble. And by applying external stimulation by vibration, we have break this structure and we have capable to create and get the release in a sustained and at the same time in a pulse style manner. When you require the drug release to be occurred, you apply the external sonication, external vibration and break the structure and drug molecule can be released. You can see here the right side drug release image, you can see the drug release versus time. You have, you, you, the arrow mark indicate there is the you know, application of the, sonar, the ultrasound. You can see when the ultrasound on, so drug is released. Again, stop that no drug release. So like that, you can get a so, pulsar style release of drug molecules. At the same time, we can able to get continuous release also by keeping the sonication on for longer time or you can go for a pulsar style region. You can see the drug is loaded inside the digital structure by some sort of metal and chelating property of that is toxorubicin as C11 O ketone group that can be coordinated with, you know, hexagonally coordinated the zinc atom on the surface. And then you are able to get this drug loading. And what you have seen that when you have a drug with a dox with ZNO, that you can see the two micromolar concentration, the toxicity, the cell is quite low. That indicating that you know, most of the cell death occurred with the, this formulation. So in addition to this, we also developed different mice cells, vesicles, as well as solilipid nanoparticles, liposomes, or even you know, drug uh, polymeric conjugate. So by self-assembly approach and use them as a different carrier molecules. So I'll just discuss one specific example that the liposomal doxorubicin formulation where you mainly use this. We developed, you know, liposome by using lipids, phospholipids. We create liposomes. We now we've added them some PG molecules to make them stable. And then we have been able to get a 50% loading efficiency of doxorubicin. You can see we said liposome is a bilayer structure. In the bilayer structure, center is the doxorubicin. What the center is hydrophilic. And we have taken the hydrochloride, which is hydrophilic in nature, by thin film hydration method. We are capable to introduce the drug molecule inside this cavity. And then we have seen the release characteristic, which is a higher at acidic pH as comparison to um, that body pH, 7.4 of cellular um, cytoplasmic pH, that the blood pH. And we have studied their cytotoxicity in case 562, which is a uh, blood cancer cell line and F549, which is a which is lung can, uh, cancer cell line. So you can compare, you can see that we have it's capable to achieve good toxicity in this type of formulations in different cancer cell lines. So after that, I have just shown here one in vivo study in mice model that we have, cre we have created a syngenic mice model. That means we introduce a human tumor in mice, uh, sorry, mice tumor in mice, that syngenic model. And so in that model, we have introduced uh, drug molecules with our liposomal formulation and then introduced to, to the to by trail when injection, uh, the first dose, second dose, third dose, and fourth dose. At the uh, fourth dose, after fourth dose, you sacrifice the uh, mice. And we have, what we have seen that with the 6 kg mg per kg drug we have uh, introduced here. And then what we have seen that you can see tumor control, where it is a, it is a tumor image that I have shown here. And the left side, the tumor control, there is a large size of the tumor. When you have a formulation, you can see here that the tumor size is quite reduced. And that marketed drug, that oxyl that we have taken from the market, and then we compare with market, our formulation is almost equivalent. And the tumor control, that spin toxicity, you can see the spin size in tumor is quite large. But when you have a free formulation, which is equivalent to the marketed one. So that means you have developed a formulation which have equivalent efficacy of the marketed drug. 
So because the, our main objective was to reduce the cost of the, you know, the formulation that we achieved here. And what you see, it's there is no abnormality of the liver and any other organ is found in case of these formulations. And that indicating that our formulation is good, suitable for you know practical applications. Also, these liposomal nanoparticles we have used them for developing nutraceutical formulation. Like you can see the liposome, we introduced a curcumin here, and the curcumin is hydrophobic. You can see the doxorubicin was in inner core, and curcumin is the bilayer structure. So we are able to get a curcumin-based liposomes as well as you know, you know nasal formulation we developed by this using this curcumin-based nasal formulation to overcome the blood brain barrier and to target to the you know, brain, you need to the most nasal drop of the solution. And this technology is transferred to, to Indian companies who they are developing their specific nasal drops for you know, nutraceutical application or some other pharmaceutical application they are developing. So I'll conclude my lecture with giving you a summary that what you've seen here that for nanoparticle has a properties which quietly different from their bulk counterpart. And this property is mainly due to the three parameters that is structural effects, size effects, and defects on the interface or defects on the surface. And to control the growth and the nuclei of the particle, you have to use specific you know, synthesis methodology based on your application. You have to choose a specific synthesis methodology and you have to functionalize with the particular organic molecules or inorganic moieties to achieve their collodial as well chemical stability and provide sites for you know further conjugation of drug or molecules and this can be achieved by both covalent and non-covalent interaction of you know biomolecules or drug or with the nanoparticles but in our study we have seen that peptide protein nanoparticle is very good formulation for you know to retain the therapeutic efficacy of anti-cancer drugs especially doxorubicin and these nanoparticles also shows with my nanoparticles shows MR contrast properties and heat activated killing of cancer cell in hypothermia um, condition. In addition, that refined nanoparticle zinc oxide, europium ductate, P304, or lipid nanoparticles we are also developing for various biomedical applications. So uh, before concluding, I'll say that these nanoparticles in the real application, you will find few examples like doxil is a doxorubicin formulation of anti-cancer drug that is already used in uh, with patients, the doxil formulation developed by Sun Pharma. Similarly, you will see that various uh, this uh, zinc oxide or TiO2 based, uh, you know, uh, this sunburn screens that are available in market as well as that uh, to enhance the mechanical strength, the badminton racket has carbon nanotube fibers as well as, you know, that uh, this uh, tennis ball has clay nanoparticles embedded to further enhance the strength. So there are a few examples like this in real application nanoparticle. So finally, I will acknowledge some of the students who have worked uh, with, for this work, uh, that's mainly Jagruti, Suman, Vijay, and Santo, they are PhD and project students. And then I'll thanks to my collaborators with whom I did most of my experiments. And finally, I'll thanks to my head, section head, Dr. P. A. Hassan, for providing uh, this facility to work and my director, division director A.K. Tyagi for supporting all type of encouragement and support, especially to allow me to work this type of you know, societal works in BRC to, um, to such an extent. And finally, I'll thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you very much you. for a uh, uh, very nice informative talk. So now it is the time for uh, uh, these uh, uh, participants' questions. Please ask questions to uh, Professor Dr. Uh, uh, Barik for uh, his talk. Uh, should I ask a question? Yes, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, uh, myself, Dr. Pankaj Kumar Singh from IIT BHU. Yes. Your presentation was nice. There is, uh, wh what do you think, what is the difference between this extracellular, intracellular way of synthesis? Intracellular, extracellular? Way of synthesis of the nanoparticles. So, intracellular, intracellular synthesis, you are talking about, that means that to synthesize nanoparticle inside the cell? Okay. No, that is it difficult to synthesize nanoparticle inside a cell. That what I told that intracellular delivery. I was talking 
that you can target the nanoparticle with, to the specific location of the tumor or the inside the cell by using uh, receptor molecules or peptides uh, conjugated, conjugation on the particle surface. That way you can target to the cells, but you can't synthesize nanoparticle inside the cell. That is only that uh, magnetotactic bacteria, if you see that magnetotactic bacteria, they eat iron and they create nanoparticle inside their body. But the synthesizing nanoparticle inside a cell is not possible. Okay, so but but uh, some some papers are showing that there is synthesis of the intracellular as well as the extracellular way of synthesis. Intracellular way of synthesis. Actually, I have not come across that particle. Anyway, the, you have introduced me to a nice uh, new topic, so definitely I will see that. Actually, but uh, as such, I think that uh, inside nanoparticle, you know, it's a cell. It's not easy. Maybe. Uh, it's possible. I'll so see those aspects actually. Okay. 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 Thank you, sir. Any more questions? I think there is no more questions. Uh, okay. I conclude uh, this uh, talk and thank to uh, the speaker, Dr. Barik, uh, regarding this uh, very informative talk. One information I would uh, like to give uh, to participants that uh, uh, they should present uh, the whole session. Otherwise, what happened? Uh, we will consider that it, it is absent. So at the end of uh, just 15 or 20 minutes, if they are present, then it will not. Uh, please listen at least uh, what is the evening. Maybe it is a diversing talk. Uh, there is a uh, lots of from bio uh, biomaterials, then uh, talk from electronics, and the talk from material science, and then is physics. But uh, as a nanotechnologist or the nanotechnology uh, FDP, you should. Uh, uh, understand or not, but uh, you have to present. Otherwise, uh, we will consider this is absent. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Barik, for his information talk. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, sir, for giving me this opportunity. Okay, thank you. So, next talk is uh, uh, again uh, Dr. Santun Kumar Behra. Uh, his uh, talk is a uh, uh, pre-ceramic polymer derived nanostructure and a hybrid for the energy application and uh, it is literally started on a two o'clock i rest here uh, the fdb program for uh, up to this two two o'clock there is a so it is a tea tea break uh, thank you very much
Good afternoon, everyone. This is our uh, last session uh, for the day, and uh, the speaker is uh, uh, Professor Santan Kumar Behra, uh, the associate professor and uh, in the Department of Ceramic Engineering. Uh, he he has uh, sorry, he is now professor. Sorry. No, no, no. I'm I'm yet to be a professor. I'm I'm still an associate professor. Okay, okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, so uh, he's a associate professor in the department of uh, ceramic engineering. He's uh, B from uh, uh, B. S. University of Technology, Burla, Sambalpur, in a, in the department of uh, electronics and telecommunication. No, no, and no, no. Uh, uh, yeah, Professor Swai, I think you you are reading the biodata of. Uh, some, some of there. my name, but in, in electronics department. So don't worry about it. I'll briefly introduce myself when the program starts. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Don't yeah, have to okay. worry about it. Sorry, sorry, sorry for yeah, sorry for oh, these things. And uh, this present talk is just uh, pre-ceramic uh, polymer derived nanostructure and a hybrid hybrids for the energy applications. Uh, uh, then, then it is over to. Uh, Professor Behera regarding its talk. Thank you very much. Please, please over to Professor Behera. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Professor Swai, uh, for this wonderful opportunity to interact interact with some of your colleagues and and other people who might have joined from different uh, other different areas. Uh, I, I I'll get going uh, uh, in in a moment. Uh, I'm a little unqualified uh, in Webex. Okay, so if there are a little bit of problems, please bear with me and please guide me if, if I run into some problem. Okay, so before we go to the uh, presentation and, you know, the today's topic, let me briefly introduce myself. Uh, there was a little mistake because probably Prof. Swai picked up the wrong guy. There's another person named Shantanu Behra but he's a professor and head of the department in the electronics engineering department at NIT Raukela. He's a much senior person. Okay, he's a full professor. So my name is Dr. Shantanu Behra. I write S-H-A-N-T-A-N-U and the other professor, he writes S-A-N-T-A-N-U. So that's the only difference. Anyway, so I, I'm an associate professor in the department of ceramic engineering at NIT Raukela. Uh, I've been here since uh, just about a decade um, in, in my last stint here, in my, in my current stint that is. Uh, I am a graduate from uh, NIT Raukla itself uh, with ceramics as my bachelor program. And uh, I worked in the industries for a couple of years and then came back to NIT as junior lecturer because that's the time when people are taking uh, into faculty with a little bit of experience and with a BTEC degree also is fine. So I worked for a while and then I went to the US for my PhD, left my job here. Um, I went to Lehigh University to do my doctoral. And that was primarily on high temperature ceramics and diffusion and what uh, actually happens in grain boundaries and how the dopant structure influences high temperature properties and things like that. So I completed that and moved on to University of Colorado at, at Boulder uh, for, for my uh, postdoctoral work. I worked with Rishi Raj, one of the very famous uh, professor in, in high temperature materials. So that's the uh, days I kind of got into polymer derived ceramics. And briefly, in, a, in about less than two years, um, in, in during my postdoc, I came back to India. And ever since, I'm, I'm here in uh, Raukela, about been 10 years. So what I'm going to uh, give you today is a um, some ideas on uh, what we've been doing on polymer derived ceramics and how that's an interesting material and then how can we manipulate things uh, to design materials from um, energy perspective because energy um, has been and uh, continues to be one of the most important areas for physicists and chemists and material scientists. So uh, that's what I'm going to be uh, talking about. So, so let me get into the screen and then see how things work out. Okay, now if it is this. Okay, screen. 
screen. Okay, can can I also uh, share my Microsoft PowerPoint presentation also, right? Please share. Uh, share the presentation yes. or, or share the screen? Share the presentation. Okay, share the sharing the presentation, right? Okay, now see if you're able to see it. All right, okay. All right, so this is it. So, okay, this is my presentation. Now let me see if I'm able to scribe something. Let me put it in the desktop. If I'm able to, okay, now it's working, right? You're able to see the marks. All right. Okay. Let me let me take it. Nice the color. Yeah, that that should be good. So yeah, gentlemen and ladies, this is what I'm going to be talking about is pre ceramic polymer derived nanostructures and hybrids for energy storage application. As, as I told you, it's it's about energy storage. We'll see how we can sort of discuss about that. And ideally, the material here is pre ceramic polymer derived materials and that 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 is because that is because um, that's the main theme of my work here in in, in Raukela and it, it's a wonderful material and I'll going forward I'll tell you uh, you know certain aspects of it and let me also tell you that um, I'm not going to be talking about uh, the physics or chemistry of the electrochemical processes or reactions because I'm not a chemist um, or not, not uh, neither an electrochemist. You know. I I identify myself as a ceramist and a material scientist. So our job is not at the atoms level. I, our job is at the slightly uh, um, higher level, or let's say in in terms of dimensions and higher level, and in terms of understanding, it's at a lower level in the sense that physics people, chemistry people, they look at atoms and molecules. We look at slightly bigger pictures you know, in terms of a few nanometers and few microns at that level. And probably pure engineers look at the bulk level, what is happening in batteries or steel structures or things like that. That's how I would like to define things in, in, in that way. So um, we would go, uh, this is the brief um, process of, of how can we go about in the studies of LIB, lithium and batteries, a little bit of introduction for that. And then we'll see how we can manipulate nanostructures uh, to make it more amenable for better performance in a lithium ion battery All right so that's that's what i uh, sort of tell you that engineering the microstructures is important All right and we can do that it's not that it's not possible and we, we can do that very well and i'll just going to give you a brief uh, case of um, it is and then we talk about polymer derived ceramics which is the main theme of the materials aspect of, of all of my work and what it is and based on that we'll develop a pdc hybrid polymer derived ceramic hybrid and see how it is suitable for uh, lib applications and then there is more to it uh, while pdc is uh, high temperature resistant materials uh, one, of, one of the most important high temperature resistant materials it still has got a lot of functional properties that we can derive on. one such example is pdc hybrid that we spoke uh, We'll talk about and then there is also we can make carbons out of it and carbon also can be uh, effective in another energy storage aspect which is supercapacitors or the edlc um, electrochemical double layer capacitors right and then i'll show you another aspect of how we can in situ generate nanostructured phases of oxides in in a polymer derived ceramic material and then based on that how that derives um, you know the processing of a hybrid capacitor wherein you can use the edlc behavior which is a supercapacitive behavior or the pseudo capacitive behavior in addition to that and then make a, a, a total capacitor which is um, higher in charge capacity at the same time uh, rate capability also Right. And then I leave you with a thought of another design concept of again coming back to lithium-ion battery anode. How can we work with the silicon anode? Uh, if time permits, we'll, we'll talk about that, and then we'll take some questions. Right. 
So you, you know that lithium ion batteries are ubiquitous it's pretty much everywhere, starting from, you know, you could see that it also can go into a pacemaker, you know, in, in your heart. And it's there in the soup. You know, cell phones, everybody has been using it and the powers have gone up, energy has gone up, it's been there in cameras, this is there in the electric vehicles, uh, where you know, big battery packs are coming up and then probably in the next five to 10 years, gasoline based engines are not going to be there anymore. And we'll be completely shifting to um, bikes and motorbikes of elect electric motorbikes and electric vehicles. And in, of course, some of the Western countries, uh, even uh, electric trucking has also started. Whereas, like goods transportation also started with electric uh, trucks. And of course, you know, um, uh, laptops and other things um, that are also there. And it has gone into the uh, the vehicles also, into supersonic vehicles, uh, uh, military vehicles, at the same time, aerostructures of commercial space also. So this is an example of the Dream Dreamliner 787. This is most the biggest and the most advanced aircraft in the passenger space. But you'll be amazed to know that in the initial um, day of operation of the 787, um, most of the aircrafts were down. They were grounded because of a problem in in the batteries, which which is what is here. You know, it's the batteries got of got fires and things like that. So it is extremely important that we take uh, care of these battery materials because they can actually be a problem um, in uh, although they are used in as much as they are used in uh, strategic and important applications their upkeep and their development is also very essential because otherwise uh, the whole system might get down right and how does it work you know it's it works on a simple electrochemical potential gradient you know you have um, and an anode on this side and then and a cathode there's a potential gradient and depending on what kind of materials you use you can fix the potential and that that's that's the voltage that's the voltage right that voltage actually uh, through a, a liquid medium it can also be a solid medium as well but then initially it started with a liquid medium that could contain lithium salts and lithium ions dissolved in it and with the potential of charging and recharging, the lithium can actually transit from here to here or here to here that give you current in one of those directions. So what we do typically is in the anode side, we use copper, um, uh, the copper is a current collector and some carbon structures, you know, the most simple being the graphite. Okay, graphite in the anode and some other nickel or cobalt containing compounds or iron phosphates uh, as, as anodes. So when you charge, you actually uh, take the lithium, which is there and the cathode down to, to the anode, and then you store it there. And that typically happens within the layers of carbon. It's sort of intercalation, sort of intercalation uh, anodes, All right? And lithium goes in and it's being stored there. And when you apply it, it comes to the um, cathode side again, and that's that's how it constitutes a, a current, and then you get get power supply. It's as simple as that. But the thing is, we are now we, we have been using it. Now we are struck with this thing: this carbon anodes they are typically three seventy six milliampere hour per gram, right? So you put ten grams, it's going to be three thousand seven hundred. But then. You know, we our, our, the, our cell phone, our cell phone has about has gone to about three thousand milliamp hour. That's capacity. All right, so that would require ten grams of uh, the anode itself. Then, then there is a cathode weight. There's other a copper uh, current collector. There's aluminum current collector. All those things get heavier. So the ob objective is to go to a compound or a material which can serve as an anode, but which will have much higher capacity than the conventional ones. In that sense, we'll be able to store more energy in the system and it'll not be heavy. So the, the cell phone, which is uh, lasting with a full charge for about one day, <clears throat> can we, you know, devise uh, anode and cathode wherein one charge can give us seven days of work. Likewise, if, a, if your vehicle is going to go for 300 kilometers, 
uh, with the battery pack, uh, can can you increase the capacity of the battery so that it can go to a thousand kilometers? So you don't have to actually recharge the battery before you can uh, traverse thousand kilometers. Or if three thousand kilometers is, is is the range, then uh, can you reduce the battery weight so that the vehicle would be much more efficient? So there's always a requirement to go for higher capacity uh, batteries. So when you talk about higher capacity in the batteries, every component of the battery has to be improved. So you have to have a better cathode, you have to have a better anode, you have to op have optimized aerial um, density of the anode particles on the current collector, which is a copper one. And then this side also for uh, the aluminum current collectors, you have to optimize the cathode materials. You have to ma manage uh, just about enough amount of uh, electrolyte containing lithium salts and not have too much of electrolyte. There is this thing about um, lithium uh, electrolytes being flammable. Uh, that's why giving up uh, potential danger for uh, a fire hazard. So that's why people are now coming up with solid state electrolytes. All right. So all those things are evolving uh, gradually and lot of, lots and lots of laboratories and very advanced laboratories are working on that. As scientific persons, we can you know, attempt to work or, and show some aspects as to what happens when we do this on the anode side or a cathode side. And my point here is that all of those materials, you know, that go into the battery, a normal person doesn't see what's, what's going on in the battery. We as material scientists or physicists or chemists, we realize that there is some material which is there, the anode or the cathode. And if we manipulate those materials, actually the performance can be better. All right. So I'm giving you a brief example of how these things work. Magnetite is you know, Fe304, Fe304, or even Fe203, that also works, an oxide of the hematite kind, all right? So Fe304 has been found out as a potential anode material. But then when we pe when people uh, tried doing that, you know, it, it showed wonderful uh, force cycle behavior, but then with multiple cycles, it sort of became down, it's passive going down. So the idea, because here in Fe304, it's a conversion anode when this converts to iron and then it again converts back, back to Fe304. And you know the density of iron, iron oxide and iron. Iron is a metal, pretty heavy. Fe304 is a ceramic containing iron. So a lot of oxygen is there. So because of that, it's, 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 it's rather light, you know, in terms of density, right? So a low density material becoming a high density material, again, going back to becoming a low density material, Again, go, coming back to high density material. So there's a lot of expansion and com contraction, expansion and contraction. And that is happening inside your battery, inside the anode. And if that happens, the anode assembly or the cathode assembly, they, they break apart, right? And the, the, uh, the material, the battery, which used to give 10 units of charge, now in, in subsequent cycling or subsequent charging and discharging, is only able to give you five units of charge and sort of goes down. That's why you know that, you know, a new battery works well and then going forward in about a month or two months time or, or a year's time, its capacity goes down. So the idea was to not take magnetite, which is bulk magnetite or the micro skills. Can we prepare nanomagnetite and see if it works? So, you know, it, it's a typical experiment that you can take uh, in, in an un, un, undergrad laboratory in material synthesis, in nanomaterial synthesis, you can ask students to prepare uh, iron oxide because iron oxide is kind of easy to prepare. And then you can also adopt various uh, physical and chemical methods to control its size. And that's what is given here. You know, you could see that the size are fairly low. You got clustered um, iron oxide particles and then there's a bigger cluster of things. And then we um, made sure that this is XRD is fine and showing decent specific surface area. So this is something which is better than uh, a macro scale, a micron level a magnetite. A micro magnetite, is, is with, with comparison to that, nanomagnetite should, should work well. And then we did some studies wherein this is a typical electrochemical behavior of um, uh, a, a, an anode, which is made in a half cell. In the half cell meaning, we use 
Fe3O4 is one electrode with some conductive additive. Uh, and then the other other, uh, uh, other uh, electrode is lithium metal. All right, so this potential is versus uh, lithium to lithium plus because it's using electrolytes as lithium plus ions. So it's, it's a half cell, it's not a full cell. In a full cell, for, for the anode, you'll have to use a cathode, which is a lithium containing compound, lithium compound. All right, here we are using a lithium metal. So here you, you see the uh, insertion cycle and the extraction cycle. In the insertion cycle, it's giving about 1500 milligram of graphite. Okay, so it's good. What's the bad stuff then? The bad stuff is that when it goes back, which is what is shown in this uh, potential, when it from it goes from from about 2.7 volt to it comes to about zero volt, not exactly zero volt, about zero volt. And then from it, this zero volt, it again goes back. This is the first cycle it tra traverses. Okay, and it goes back to little less than 1200, less than 1200. That means it's giving me 1500, taking 1500 charges, but giving back only 1200. And so this part, this part is the loss. That's called the first cycle loss. Okay, and we should minimize that. We should minimize. I'm sorry. We should minimize that because this otherwise becomes becomes a dead weight in the battery pack. And this because here it gives you 1200, and then only 1200 goes in. All right. So this 1200 goes in, and then again from from there you get something. So that way we saw that nanomagnetite was actually good in the sense that it went up to 100 cycles, and of 153 cycles also we did, and it was coming back to the original capacity. Leaving aside, of course, the first cycle loss. Don't worry about the first cycle loss. That is there. We, we have to address that. But it was not able to, uh, uh, you know, uh, so it is about 50, 55 cycles, which is what we've seen. And here you see that this is specific capacity and this is the cycle number. You see, this is the first cycle. The, here is a loss. And then subsequently, this 100, 200, 400, this is the current density that you're extracting current this is 100 milliamp per gram this is the current you're applying and you're reducing the voltage from its also it's it's open circuit potential to almost deplete it and then you charge it back and then you discharge it and like that happens and you can do that thing with 100 milliamp per gram or a 200 milliamp per gram or a 400 milliamp per gram that's like increasing the current why it is important because Sometimes you use the batteries in a normal flow of current, right? Sometimes you need a battery to perform in a very high current application. For example, for example, if you're using a tool, tool, for example, if you're using the driller machines, using a cell phone would require that there be constant flow of current. But then using a, a drill, that would require high current operation which is going to revolve the a tool bit and has to penetrate either the wooden thing or concrete or something. So there you would require high current. So we need to be able to understand what is happening in the high current. And as engineers, we should be able to prepare materials, to prepare batteries, which can perform um, you know, equally efficiently uh, in high, high uh, current conditions as well. But then that is wishful thinking. It's not going to work out. The amount of capacity that you can retain at 100 milliamp per hour, milliamp per gram kind of current density, the same we are not going to be able to extract at let's say 2000 milliamp per gram. 2000 milliamp per gram is 2 ampere per gram. 2 ampere per gram is a very high current. Okay, if you apply that much of current, getting that much, that that highest specific capacity that you are getting at 100 milliamp per gram that's not going to be possible. Okay. It's because here there are kinetic limitations. Here things have to move and move and back and forth very, very fast. All right. So if at 100 milliamp per gram, whatever, how many of lithium ion are moving and then coming back, if the same MR, same number of lithium are able to move at a 2 ampere per gram, then you'll get that kind of capacity. But that is not possible. But then that is where materials engineers and physicists come in play they can they change the microstructure so that the kinetic limitations are taken away. 
there is something in thermodynamics. Thermodynamics sets the boundaries and we cannot go past that. But if there are kinetic limitations, then, you know, material scientists or physicists or chemists, they can design material in such a way that those kinetic limitations are hindered or, or taken away and the material can perform its pass. So here with the nanomagnetite, we should be happy that it is at least working at the 2 ampere per gram capacity. And after working at 2 ampere per gram or even 4 ampere per gram, it is coming back to normal higher capacity when you do it at the 100 milliamp per gram kind of cycling. So nanomagnetite is, is working. The point I want to bring in here is that when you reduce the material size, when you take it to the nano level, um, the strain is not so high and it is able to uh, equally uh, or, or efficiently expand to uh, or contract to become iron and then expand to become iron oxide and it doesn't crumble, right? It can continue for long time. But then, then as this document was created, but since it's a pre existing document, I have to do it. Hello? Hello? Uh, yes, uh, 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 Professor, uh, your voice is not coming uh, correctly. Oh, my voice is not coming. Breaking. Uh, let me just check. Uh oh. Let me go to. I think my voice to see using the microphone. Okay. So is it not coming at all or is, is dub, it's echoing? No, it's okay. Please continue. Uh, is it okay now? Okay. Yes. All right. Okay, okay. One moment, please. All right. So, yeah, the thing is, if we are able to do things with nanomagnetite, can we do it a little better? So what we thought of using, let's say, graphene oxide, these are the graphene oxide. These are pictures of graphene oxide. Now. And that you connect with this small nanomagnetites. What happens is it will it'll efficiently transfer the, the electrons or the lithium ion. So this, this is conductive and this is very fine. And if you're able to disperse things at a very nanometric level, you should be able to get much better capacity and much better current current rate. That means if you're able, you should be able to charge it well and then char discharge it well. Okay. And we did some experiments on that, and then it turns out it uh, th th this is where we are driving at 0.1 C capacity. That means we are completely discharging the material in 10 hours. Here, you know, it's about one hour. Here it's about in half an hour. Here's a four C's, 15 minutes. This is like 15 minutes complete discharge of the whole cell. It's coming out, working out very well, fine. And then what will be interesting here is that we were able to do some massive cycling, you know, drawing a T2C, two 2C two when in complete discharge in one hour, I mean half an hour, and complete charge in again half an hour. It, these are symmetric cycling data. And you could see that here it is the, the efficiency was almost 100%, almost 100% here. That means whatever is going in, the same was coming out. The Coulombic efficiency is 100%. And then here we did it for 100 cycles at 2C and then 100 to 400, 300 cycles at 10C. 10C meaning you should be able to discharge and charge the current in about six minutes. To, to, all right, that's based on iron oxide a specific capacity to so six minutes discharge and six minutes charge and gives us about about 200 milliamp hour per gram and the columbic efficiency was always 100 percent that's a fairly fast cycling all right and if without graphene oxide if you do that in 50 cycles it will die the whole cell will die on the contrary we use graphene oxide and then the cycling was so good that even it's we did test up to 800 cycles and it was coming absolutely fine. So the point I want to bring in is that with nano manipulation or manipulation at the nanometric level, you should be able to change the performance of, of anodes or cathodes or any electrochemical electroactive material. All right. So giving this thing, we can go to another material which is called polymer derived ceramics. And the whole idea would be to 
how we can manipulate these structures and then make materials that that will be suitable for um, electrochemical system, be it lithium ion battery or be it a supercapacitor. So, okay, this the, the pre ceramic polymers are a special class of material where there will be a silicon. These are typically liquid, typically liquid, liquid, or these are solids which can be converted into liquid by you know dispersing them into alcohols. For example, IPA, isopropyl alcohol, or um, DMF, dimethyl formamide, or acetonitrile, or anything of that sort. These, these things are nitrobenzene. We can use a, an appropriate a solvent, and then uh, some of the materials can be made into that. You can make a slurry out, out of it. And then it's it's a molecular slurry. It's not that a typical clay slurry kind of thing. All right, it will be very, very molecular. Polymer strands, or depending on what the structure is, they, they can be completely entangled within the, within the, within the um, solvent, and you can actually uh, make make a thick solvent or thin solvent, depending on what kind of things you could do. Right. So likewise, you have too many different types of silicon-containing polymers, which is polycarboxylanes, poly uh, sorry, this is poly polycarboxyloxanes, polysiloxanes. Polysilsis wherein you know you have a silicon is to one uh, oxygen ratio of one is to one point five, where siloxane is one is to one ratio of silicon and oxygen. Polycarbosilane this is one of the most important things which is going into military and space applications is that from this liquid precursor you can prepare silicon carbide, right? And from this polysiloxanes you'll be able to prepare something which is called silicon oxycarbide. And from the polysilicoxins also, you should be able to prepare silicon oxycarbide. And there are polysilazins or polysilyl carbodimides, wherein you can prepare silicon carbonitrate materials, which is something you can present in silic silicon carbon oxygen uh, phase field. The same thing you can present in silicon carbon nitrogen phase field, the same tricomponent system in an elemental form. You can use polo, polyborosilazines, wherein SICN is again doped with boron. Okay, and that can increase the uh, melting point or you know decomposition point of these materials. They they are pretty much used in coating materials and all. So these are wonderful materials. Start from a polymer, slurry, liquid-based thing, and can convert into. <laughs> Excuse me a little bit. Oh, I'm, <coughs> I'm sorry, folks. I know it was a strategy. Okay, so <coughs> we can convert these materials into high temperature ceramics and make use of them. This is how the <coughs> processing of these materials go. Within a low temperature, you can prepare material in the cross-linking stage. And then from about 400 to about 1400 degrees Celsius, you can pyrolyze these materials. <coughs> Typically in uh, argon or nitrogen or nitrogen hydrogen containing atmosphere to give you ceramic which is typically amorphous well, like typically amorphous materials and they have <coughs> uncommon structures of um, silicon and oxygen and carbon which you would not find in any crystallographic material like silica or carbon or silicon carbide so they have a uh, kind of <coughs> intermediate structure between the complete amorphous materials like glass and a completely crystalline material for example silica or silicon carbide or silicon nitride and things like that but then still if you take to high temperature pyrolysis which is typically in, in excess of 1400 degrees celsius up to about 2000 degrees celsius you'd start getting uh, formation of nanocrystallites of silicon carbide silicon nitride and silica a little bit of free carbon and that uh, eventually ends up making the whole body perfectly crystalline. 
All right, so only at the high temperature pyrolysis that, that thing happens. Otherwise, in the range of 1000 to 1400 degrees Celsius, 1000 to 1400 degrees Celsius, it gives a unique structure that is um, at best called pseudo amorphous, if not completely amorphous. All right, and you'll get all the attributes of that. And uh, I said, you know, you can put it in the silicon and carbon and oxygen phase field, which is typically, uh, you know, explains the silicon oxycarbide materials. And you want to uh, explain the silicon carbonite materials instead of oxygen, you can put nitrogen here and it will pretty much be the same. And this is the area where you can sort of define the composition of the silicon oxycarbide materials. That's on the composition part. If you take a high temperature, I mean, high resolution electron micrograph, they pretty much look like amorphous materials. They look at this sad pattern also. And then we want to take a Fourier filtration of the area. You, you, you see no, no fringe, no fringe at all. So it's completely amorphous material, uh, at least till about 1000 degrees Celsius. Interestingly, you can get signatures, signatures of the D and G peak of carbon that you typically find in graphite. Right? So this Raman spectroscopy tells a completely different story in the sense that it is, it is amorphous, gross scale from XRD point of view, and even to a good extent from high resolution electron microscopy. But then if you do a Raman, it pick, picks out structures of layered carbon, which is given by this D and G uh, peaks, all right? And based on all of those things, it is de it's designed to, uh, you know, have, have a structure which is something like this, which is the Rishira's model of EDC structure, which is like this. Here in this domain, you have what is typically a silicon oxycarbide based domain, all right? And alongside that, you can have graphene layers. These are carbon layers. <coughs> All right. You have carbon layers here. And between them, there is a layers of mixed bonded tetrahedra. This is where silicon can be co connected to oxygen and carbon and oxygen and carbon. <coughs> Whereas this is typical silica octahedra, I mean uh, tetrahedra, where it is sp2 bonded carbon, and somewhere in these regions you have this mixed bond. So, <coughs> so that's what the structure is. Its importance will be known a little later. And it turns out this typical structure actually conducts or intercalates lithium ions. Why is that? Because you know you have carbon structures as well, and you have some mix of bonds here. Someone tried. I think a professor from Canada, Bruno Scorsati. They tried uh, some of these materials, and then it, it showed interesting behavior, which is what is given here. They almost gave like fifteen hundred milliamp hour per gram, or sixteen hundred. But the reverse cycle, it was only giving back to about thousand or eleven and thousand fifty. That means an around 500 milliamp hour per gram is lost the first cycle. Can we do something about that? I, I don't think we can because if it is thermodynamically not feasible for this lithium because this lithium is taken up by some silicon oxygen unfinished bonds and then lithium doesn't come back from there. Lithium doesn't come back from there. So it is contained and this is the portion it is totally occupied, you know, lithium doesn't come back. But the other one, about 1050 milliamp per gram, milliamp hour per gram, this should be able to, this should be reversible in the sense that it should be able to charge it and discharge it and charge and discharge it. And then all the time it should be able to give you to take this much of lithium and give this much of lithium back, which actually was not happening. And then we thought that is it is it because these materials when you paralyze them these are big blobs big blobs of about like five micron ten micron <coughs> some some idea came that i thought can we make it little porous so that this can, this can you know uh, the um, intrusion of lithium or interaction of lithium with these materials can be softened how do you do that 
we thought okay now these materials are <clears throat> bulk material this is bulk <coughs> limited porosity the porosity is very limited here all right but if 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 this can be started from a liquid root can we put a, a nanostructured oxide template okay and then the, coat the liquid around it and if you collect all of those things this much of material this much of pdc can be coated onto many small droplets and this total mass <coughs> can now remain as coating do you see the rational of things so it is the same material it is actually the same material but then we are distributing this since it is available in the liquid form we distribute it in such a way that it can go and coat all nanostructured oxide particles all right so you we took this as titania nanoparticles you can see degusa degusa is the company which makes this p25 <coughs> titania a very very controlled size titania they make or you can take some anatase prepare some anatase like 20 to 25 nanometer that's what we took and we coated the silicon oxycarbon all around and we started <coughs> looking at the nanostructure it's not so easy it's not so easy to make uh, take a nanostructured material and take a polymeric coating around it and then paralyze at high temperature and still be able to get this kind of nanostructure <coughs> that we had talked about so beautiful nanostructure it was not so straightforward but we sort of figured out how to do it in by using a lot of surfactants and all that and you could see that here it is a blob of nanostructure wherein the small particles are contained within right if you go a little, little uh, higher then you see that this is the particle this is the particle but this is the coating this is the coating <coughs> and you see that this is a through and through picture this is not a two dimensional picture this is a blob so all these particles are not at the same level one is the top one is the bottom it's it's a it's a total picture <coughs> sorry we are seeing it through and through all right in all of those things you would see that there is a clear coating of silicon oxycarbide around some denser phase which is the titania phase okay now let's see how these things can work in electrochemical behavior turns out the first cycle loss was actually actually lot bad lot worse that is because there is a lot of high surface surface specific surface area available and it was forming something called an sei solid electrolyte interface that's another problem that can be done at a different time the approach for that is different but subsequently what we figured out that it's going from 600 to about 1500 almost 9 million hour per gram is capacity it was giving which is fairly good enough all right and of course the cycle the first cycle loss was a little important but what we were worried about is the charge discharge be fast ultra fast charge discharge behavior that was our objective and that's what we started doing and we started the experiments at 200 milliamp directly <clears throat> to 200 milliamp per gram all right and it it was giving about about 850 kind of uh, capacity we consistently ramped the current 400 800 or 1600 and about 3000 milliamp and even then it was keeping about 300 <clears throat> milliamp per gram capacity which is what your carbon would give 376 milliamp hour per gram is the graphite capacity that's the very very slow current that again is a theoretical current okay we you use it in normal practices what you get is barely 100 or 200 milliamp per gram wherein here we are applying about 3000 milliamp hour per gram i mean milliamp per gram but you are, we are getting a, almost the same amount of capacity specific capacity so this design was actually successful <clears throat> and we ramped it up to higher uh, currents also and i am not going to show you too many of this data and then what the point i want to show you here is that you look at these numbers 
13, 20. <clears throat> Those are massive current rates. Even our normal appliances, what you use is in for industrial machinery or at least laboratory machinery, you use a 15, 15 ampere plug from a normal electric supply. Here we are using 20 ampere per gram kind of current. That's huge current for a battery. Other battery would fry in those conditions. But then this was able to give us some consistent current. Consistent capacity, more than 50, about 60 or 70 it was giving. But more importantly, look at this. It starts from about 300 cycles to goes about to 500 cycles. That means 200 cycles at 20 milliamp, 20 ampere per gram. That's a massive current. And it's, it's sustaining that. <clears throat> More than that, if you reduce the current, the capacity increases. If you further reduce the current, the capacity still increases further. So much so that if you put it again to 100 milliamp per gram, which is coming back to the normal capacity of 800, 850 ampere per gram, milliamp power per gram. That means this, whatever the structures that we are making and we're pasting it on the anode, it is being robust. Robust in the sense of what? Not, not like good <clears throat> mechanical strength. But then at the nanostructure level, it has so much of mechanical strength that it is able to withstand the constant compression and expansion or whatever lithium intercalation that is happening in the system. And it is able to take up lithium at a much faster rate. It's, go, it's able to discharge lithium at a much faster rate also. This is exactly what we want. So this would actually be a perfect anode material. Only problem is that if you can figure out what is happening in the first couple of cycles, first cycle, not even a couple of cycles. If you're able to figure out what is happening in the first cycle, and then if you're able to stop that, then this kit could be a wonder material in terms of high, high cycle capacity. <coughs> Knowing microstructure also little helps. This is a pristine microstructure. This is a sort of virgin electrode. Okay, but nothing has happened here, only soaked with elect electrolytes and this one is after 3000 charge discharge cycling. And you see that there is literally no difference, no difference in the microstructure of the anode. Otherwise, you'd see, excuse me, if you, if you see the microstructure sometimes, even after 50 cycles, you know, you, you'll see that these kind of balls are peeling off. This will simply fall off. These, these blobs will simply fall off from the structure. What will be left is only <coughs> the copper electrode beneath. You could see some cracks here. It is like mud cracking, you know. If you look at the uh, wet fields and after that they become sun dried, you will see some kind of cracking happening, right? Because of the expansion and contraction of, of the clay. Some of these you could see here, but then a very milder level. Why do I say it milder? Because something which has undergone for 3000 cycling, there is no milder condition that is applied. It's very aggressive conditions have been applied with that. But despite that, it is only showing some minor cracks, not even falling off. That means the, the anode is very, very robust. All right. So what we worked out is actually, what we thought is actually it worked out. Right. And this is some kind of a, this is a stem image, which sort of uh, gives you the idea of, this is the total particle, which is, looks like Africa about 100 to 100 meter, nanometer wide and about 500 nanometer across, 500 to 600 nanometer across. But that's only the particle. But if you look at it, there are only blobs of this titanium. This is what we're seeing here. This is this is silicon, this is titanium. This is the EDS uh, mapping of titanium here and silicon here and oxygen here and carbon here. Because uh, this is a titania seco hybrid, okay, which is extremely, uniform and uniform at what level uniform at the level of nanometers sub nanometers sub hundreds of nanometers that is you know it this this could be in the range of 50 nanometer this is 20 nanometers 10 nanometer it is homogeneous in these nanometers right and that is one of the reasons that it is able to take up lithium you know in from very different spots it takes up lithium and then leaves lithium and that's why it is able to undergo uh, 400 or 800 kind of cycles. This is another set of experiments that I'm showing, right? And if you look at the current rate, <clears throat> this is what the bulk silicon oxycarbide, and this is the current rate 
uh, in our enhanced titanium seco hybrid. And of course, some of these uh, blue dots, you see that these are again cycle data after 2000 cycles. So we did 2000 cycling and then again they took those cells and then, uh, you know, applied the current at this level and you measured specific capacity. There is only small reduction in that, right? It's almost the same thing. So this was actually working out well. Let's not get into that. Let's, let's get into another type of design, which is the, my last thing or and some other things I'll show you. Most importantly, what we can build is that we started from here. We are able to coat something, silicon oxycarbide or some other polymer derived ceramic material or around a nanoparticle template. All right. Now let's go another step farther. Instead of titania, I, we took titania in the last one. Can we not take something else? Yes, we, of course we can. So this time what we did, we took some carbon, nanocarbon we took instead of titanium. This nanocarbon is what? Like carbon black you use in tires, you know, in, in truck or um, vehicular tires, we use a lot of nanocarbon. It's fairly cheaply available. Billa carbon, Philips carbon, all sorts of carbons are available. And if you look at a micrograph of those things, these are in the range of 20 to 25 nanometer particles. Very cheap. Can we use that and see, you know, sort of from a scientific standpoint, can we look at, use them and then try, try and change, manipulate the microstructure a little further? took this and then coated silicon oxycarbide around it like we did in the last time. But then we went a step farther. What is that step? So you know that the silicon oxycarbide is the coating. And at one point I told you that silicon oxycarbide has a structure that has silica, carbon, and some mixed bonds. All right. And now the silica nano, these are nano domains. They are in the range of two to six nanometer. Mostly in the range of two to five, three nanometers. Now, this material has a coating which has two to three nanometers of silica, right? Now, what if I take those silica out? I can do some etching, all right? Now, if I'm able to take those two to three nanometer silica out from the coating, then I'll have a structure where I'll have a carbon at, at the template because I've started with carbon, nanocarbon as a template. And around it, I had silicon carbide from which I've taken silica out. Okay, now what I'll be eventually having is some kind of a carbon template and a, a, a coating, a coating wherein silica has been taken out. All right, so I might have those porous porosity of silica coming in here. So, Bunker, I, I'm in a meeting. I'll I'll call you later. Okay. <clears throat> so I'll I'll have uh, a carbon as the core, and then the exterior I'll have a very porous coating. That again, it's essentially carbon. Okay. So what I'll have is a very very porous carbon, and that porosity can be in the range of two to six nanometers. Or I can actually manipulate those porosity by manipulating the structure of SICO. That was the idea. So we did something and let, let me see. This is a C C C I O C microstructure. Or C C I O C I C O or whatever you call that. That's that's fine. So there's this carb carbon in the middle and then some silicon oxycarbide in the outside, which is not very clear from here in this pocket, let me be honest. But here you, you could somewhat guess that it is a combination of two kinds of materials so typically making some kind of a coating and something in the middle but then when we took the uh, leaching and then take took silica out of it what we are we, what we got is these kind of structures wherein you can clearly see a, a graphy graphitic kind of coating on top of right these are the graffiti coatings and then it's not that we are just saying it we sort of made magnification of that and made Fourier transform of these structures and we figured out that it is ma matching with this 0.34 nanometer kind of uh, graphitic, uh, you know, the size, you know, the 002 size of 0.34 nanometer, 3.3 3 .3 angstroms, 
that's what it is matching maybe it's slightly expanded here also you'll find that with various positions this is the nanocarbon and these are the these are the coatings this is a coating having graphene type of structure all right and we looked at uh, the uh, porosity also because that that's what is important for some other kind of behavior you have to have higher porosity and these are the carbon seco structures which is unedged and we are, we we were getting porosity in the range of 3 nanometer you know two and a half to four nanometer kind of thing and some in the range of one to two nanometer all right but when we leached you could see that this three four nanometer porosity is there two and a half to three four nanometer porosity is there but what is producing is massive increased porosity in the range of one to two nanometer here also the massive increase porosity in the one to two nanometer in particular for a different kind of for one particular H type of um, polymer derived ceramic, you could see that these curves are going up. And here from 1.2 onwards, it is not measuring because we have, you know, nitrogen methods. If you use um, carbon dioxide kind of methods or other methods, you should be able to prove what is, ha what is happening in the less than one region. All right, here it is dropping off so, you know, we could see that, okay, this is the max, this is the max, 1.2 is the max you're getting. But here in these materials, these are still in the rising pattern. That means there is still porosity in the 1 to less than, less than 1 nanometer region. So, this will, this is giving us, these carbon hybrids uh, <coughs> are giving, giving us much higher porosity and much higher uh, volume also, poor volume. Now, if, if you have a carbon material and that is massively uh, in terms of massive in terms of specific surface area then why not try and use them in supercapacitors that's what we did we tried to look at the electrochemical behavior of these carbon materials from for supercapacitor application and then we, we what we saw is uh, a combination of behavior of all of these materials you know here some of these materials didn't go as planned but some materials are actually showing the typical edlc kind of behavior edlc typical behavior would be something like this right and if you theoretically talk about edlc behavior it should be a rectangle all right turns out there is some kind of a you know pseudo active component here is slightly bending like rectangular but here it is maximum was here almost rectangular behavior these are edlc behavior this is a electric double layer capacitive behavior and then what comes out is a very good uh, current density that we are measuring with with a voltage window of about 0.8 to about minus 0.8 to about 2 so it's one volt kind of window and it is giving us about 2 to 3 ampere per gram kind of current density and if we um, if we sort of measure those things it's almost coming as in the range of 333 farad per gram that is the highest we got for for an aqueous electrolyte also koh based we use organic electrolytes this number could be slightly lower all right but doesn't matter even if we are talking about aqueous electrolytes this number is a pretty good number given that these materials are you know quite straightforward to make all right and we do some electro uh, impedance spectroscopy where you can see that it, it's coming in the range of um, about 0.2 hertz okay 0.2 hertz or less than uh, or 0.2 or 0.3 hertz that means you can charge discharge these things in four seconds right so anything less than 10 seconds anything less than 10 seconds they should be called supercapacitors you can charge things in 10 seconds and then discharge in 10 seconds very high power applications those are supercapacitors right and there are uh, capacitors also which scatter in the range of a uh, few minutes they can be charged in few minutes and can be discharged in few minutes nothing is good nothing is bad 
all right we have to make a combination of um high power as well as high energy materials so all this while we are talking about some kind of edlc that is super capacitors okay they store things in uh, <clears throat> in very efficiently on on a double layer basis well at only surface uh, layer charge basis but then when we talk about pseudo capacitors okay they can choose they can store higher charge but then they cannot store much quicker or they cannot deliver much quicker that's about pseudo capacitors all right turns out uh, oxides are some kind of oxides are largely known for pseudo capacitors they typically converts they are they're based on redox reactions redox reactions right typically ruthenium based um, lately tungsten and niobium and lately vanadium these are the materials these these oxides are have the potential to make uh, pseudo capacitors right now in in this context i'll i'll give you the last uh, application La yeah manganese oxide someone also said yeah manganese oxide i'm forgetting manganese oxide okay. now the question is can we can we uh, make some material where there will be an oxide and there will be some edlc based carbon also can we make a hybrid between edlc and super uh, and pseudo capacitors also because if you have more uh, pseudo capacitors your typical charge storage would be higher but if you have a more edlc component then the uh, you know the fastness the fastness of in the charge uh, discharge response will be, will be much good much better so you should be able to um, store more charge at the same time deliver and and you know use uh, the, the, those collected charge much quicker can we do that so my next thing is uh, come, coming in that so that's what i'm saying here you know it's a typical uh edlc kind of behavior and you know it sort of becomes a slightly resistive capacitor when it's becoming slightly like this which is what some of our samples we had seen like this you know but then when we when we see a curve like this that's where the influence of pseudo capacitance comes and uh, you know this is based on some redox reactions okay why this thing is coming to me is based on some other work that we were doing. Rahul Anand is a guy who is completing his doctoral, his submitted his thesis. He did some work for high temperature materials. Okay, that is what turbine coating, turbine blade coating, and he was using the same kind of materials, silicon oxy, silicon carbon nitride. All right, and he was. Uh, this is also another polymer, polymer. and you're using titania into that. And in the process, what we found is that if you, I, I'm not sure if you're able to see something, but here, this is a, you know, a big piece of the titania SIC and structure, wherein you can see a lot of small dots of silicon of titania. Turns out these are titania. And if you annihilate a little further, you can can be in the range of, you know, 520 nanometers kind of range. This is our small pox, this, this, that kind of structure we got very uniformly distributed all around all right and we do did the same things in hafnia hafnium based material in the same silicon carbon nitride this microstructure was not good not that the material was bad but the imaging was hasn't been good but if you look at this one in particularly this region you can see a lot of small dots and those are hafnium oxide and one of those dots is, is sort of shown like this all right and you can see some of these hafnium oxide particles right and the same thing we also found in zirconia the same uh, you know dot 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 kind of gamori kind of structure and you can see that it's in the range of what two to five nanometers now this is massive what it tells me that we are able to get transition metal box based oxides we start from a molecular source there is some salt of zirconium or hafnium or titanium you can start with that this readily off the shelf from market and we do something we can create those small particles extremely small particles of two nanometer all right 
and so much so that um, uh, Rahul was able to stabilize the tetragonal zirconia uh, in, in, in this matrix and then also half tetragonal half nil in the matrix till about in, in the range of 1400 degrees Celsius he was able to retain the tetragonal structure but that's a different story the story the, the thing that we should take from here is that we are able to control these small structures in a PDC matrix now what if like someone suggested manganese can we do vanadium manganese or niobium or tungsten can we have oxides of these materials or carbides or nitrides of these materials dispersed in a SICN matrix like these small ones if you're able to do so then this can work as a high capacity pseudo capacitor right now from this SICN structure or SICOC structure and if I take the silica out of it again then what I can be left with is some oxides of this tungsten or niobium or manganese or vanadium connected with a carbon network okay this carbon network will give me EDLC structure EDLC behavior whereas these oxides these oxides are going to be so that's that's my idea of uh, pseudo capacitor design pseudo capacitors and EDLC merge together that will give me high charge discharge capability at the same time high capacity from from the pseudo capacitors all right and turns out it actually works well this is also the zirconia tether. this is the one of the best micrographs you'd find all right and this this, this is you know one piece of the um, random piece of the zirconia pdc network and you can see a highly a homogeneously distributed zirconia tetragonal zirconia in the matrix all right now if you take this we did something with the vanadium system with silicon oxycarbide and then vanadium oxide in the ca derived carbon system but not from a not from a molecular source of vanadium we just took random source of vanadium oxide that is available in the market turns out you have really good data available all right <coughs> it's not breaking up it is giving over an extended voltage window it is giving but it's certainly it is showing me the pseudo capacity behavior it is not entirely edlc behavior it is not entirely pseudo capacitive behavior it is a combination of these two precisely how we had planned it out and you can also see in you know you can discharge the things in very flat in small time you can take a little longer and then discharge it you can take simply longer and also discharge it giving longer time uh, discharge at, at, a, at a smaller current rate all right now this thing the sudin sudin sukumaran is working on that and he also did a uh, initial trial on using vanadium based um, molecular precursor and and derived uh, carbon from that so we typically have you know have a, this vanadium oxide or oxycarbide this is i cannot i cannot say yet as what is that vo2 is vo2 or five or even vo with some carbon it contains the vanadium oxycarbide or something we are yet to identify that but then I have vanadium components here, but at the same time, at some kind of a carbon network, and you can have pores here also. Okay, and some kind of graphene network. So it, it's 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 a typically a hybrid. I cannot call it a composite. Composite is where you know you can take a crystallographic material, crystallographically significant material, you put another crystallographically distinct material mix them or by doing something you get some of those things those are typically uh, some things are called composites okay these ones are highly irregular materials highly uh, you know uncommon materials which you cannot produce by other routes okay and there is no distinct um, distinction of all those phases individual phases so that's why i'm calling it a in a hybrid and actually giving a similar kind of behavior you can see that the different rate it is the the peak current or the peak voltage is shifting here also it is shifting but here the clearly it is showing me pseudo capacitive behavior because of this curve here this is based on redox reactions at the same time it's also giving me some amount of some amount of edlc behavior if you're able to draw a rectangle within that it should be able to give you some EDLC behavior or a resistive EDLC behavior. 
right? And the numbers that we calculated uh, for not from galvanostatic discharges, but from, from uh, voltammetry, we are getting is very high number in the range of 1200, 1200 farad per gram. All right, so these are the numbers we are getting. And, the, and these are initial experiments that, that uh, some of the results that I, I showed you about. All right, so um, I'll stop it here. There's another idea of silicon design that I'll not talk about. All right, so it's already taking time. So let me take just just about one one more minute to thank some of those scholars. Ipsita is, see, is mostly responsible for the carbon-based work. Smita is doing the silicon-based work that I haven't presented much of yet. Sudin is doing the vanadium-based uh, supercapacitors work, and the Navishik did some other porous porous material, macro material work, which actually laid the foundation of these materials. And Rahul uh, mostly worked on the in situ generated generation of the oxide and uh, carbide phages in, in the PDC matrix. All right. I also should thank Professor Rishi Raj. You know, he's my, my postdoctoral mentor. I worked with him for about less than a couple of years. But then, whatever I had learned in my PhD, that built the base of what I work. But then I chose uh, my subsequent work. Uh, in terms of material systems is something that I learned in Boulder. In Lehigh, I used a lot of tools and techniques, but the things were really difficult to be undertaken in, in, in India because there were high temperature materials works with facilities are not, not available here, like using a synchrotron source or using high um, resolution microscopes. Those are not available right uh, away with us. Okay, so um, mostly my work uh, inspiration comes from my postdoctoral years. Uh, that that is where you know from Boulder. Uh, Shubhankar is uh, you know a very good friend. Uh, sometimes he has helped us in measuring some things and all that. We, while we were building our laboratory here, and CRB, most of the funding that I've received, two major major grants uh, in in CRGs, I've got it from CRB, and they should be thanked always for you know. Um, enabling me to do what I've done um, right right now, and uh, a small acknowledgement to Humboldt Foundation for um, you know facilitating a visit to Forshanjan from Yulish, uh, where the initial discussions of some of the work had begun, and uh, I would say that 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 has a major influence in the way I've gone about uh, doing some of this work. All right, so thank you so much, and thank you. Um, NIT Manipur and especially Professor Swain uh, is a wonderful guy and he's always reached out to us um, whenever he had some um, program and all that and um, I'm, I'm really appreciate uh, you people listening to me and giving me an opportunity to present and discuss some of my work. Um, I'll, I'll keep it here and if there are uh, some questions I'll try to answer them otherwise we can um, take it forward. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Vera. Yeah. Uh, now it is uh, open for uh, the audience uh, questions. So please, if you have any doubts, please ask. Any questions? Uh Sir, good afternoon, sir. Yes, ma'am. Uh, sir, uh, can uh, can we differentiate uh, a composite material from hybrid material through XRD, sir? How to differentiate? Uh, actually, no, ma'am. You got uh, yeah. You you got me at a very wrong point because I don't know if there is a, a formal definition of what would you call a composite or hybrid. That is in a name. Abraham ko Sita bolie kya farak padta hai? Okay, so yeah, yeah. What I'm saying is. It, it is just in the name, what, what we call it. Well, to, uh, in, 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 well let, me, let me respond to that in a, in a informal way. When I say composites and hybrid, uh, I don't think there's a formal definition of what would you call a composite and what would be called a hybrid. What I gather, what I understand that might be wrong, is that uh, a typical combination of um, Ex existent or known or you know 
common crystallographic phases is something that I would call a composite. Maybe if it is dispersed or mixed in a very homogeneous at the nanometric level, I would call it a nanocomposite. Okay. But when we call a hybrid, it's I think those those are slightly different materials, right? Typically not between an oxide and an oxide. Okay. And and things which are not um, generally understood or perceived or figured out by common methods. For example, like you said, can we understand it by uh, crystallography from X-ray diffraction? X-ray di diffraction is a data tool. It doesn't, it, it, it is blind. It is, this is spectroscopic method, all right? Unless we look at what physically it looks like, we cannot tell. We certainly cannot tell. And of course, XRD can give you a clue because it will not give you any typical X-ray diffraction patterns. All right. A normal composite and a micro or nano composite in an XRD, you should be able to differentiate as much as you are able to differentiate in the size. All right. In its distribution, XRD will not tell you too much unless it's a very pattern structure and you are going to small angle X-ray and things like that. So, X-ray is a data tool. It is not a visual tool. Electron microscopy, on the other hand, would be a visual tool. But what I mentioned, what I what what I uh, indicated as, as as a hybrid, because it's not a not those typical materials that you can make a composite by mixing two things together. Okay. Right. It's it's in situ prepared by doing some operations which otherwise, otherwise it, it's, it's not possible to prepare by simple mixing of those individual phases. All right. So that's why I, I would call it a hybrid. But if that is wrong, then I might, might change it, you know. So to answer your question, there is no exact method. But um, electron microscopy being a visual tool would, would tell you whether to call it a hybrid or a composite. Yes, Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Any questions? Sir, should I ask a question? Hello. Yes, please. Yes. Yeah, please. Uh, uh, my question is very basic question regarding the spin coater. Yeah. What is the specification requirement of the spin coater instrument regarding the Hydraulic pump that is used. Spin coating. Yes. Sir, I haven't used a spin coater. I know that there is a spin coater that people make uh, make use of in spins, making you know, make making uh, films by by spinning it, spinning a liquid on top. But that's that. My knowledge is up to that only. But, um, otherwise, I have never used a spin coater. I don't know why would you ask me that. Okay. But you know, I would I would expect this to be a simple motor, a controllable motor. Uh, there is some vacuum pump is used. Actually, I was uh, searching on that, so I was asking. Okay, oh, you, you, yeah, okay. that's right. You, 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 there are number of companies available. Uh, okay. Which is sort of holding it up, and then yeah. you put it. I mean, that's that's what the basic principle of operation is. But I'm, I'm not an expert in that. I think. Uh, Dr. Pankaj Kumar, uh, please, uh, uh, there is a motor uh, you can buy from the, this is very low cost one. Uh, better mm -hmm. you uh, buy one rotary pump or uh, roots pump. I think uh, that is better for uh, spin cutter. Otherwise, uh, uh, there is a ready mate. If you buy some uh, spin cutter, then it, the, the pump will be uh, available within uh, it. So, so, uh, so, so I think, uh, the, what is your question, please? No, regarding the vacuum pump, what is the specification of the vacuum pump required in the spin coater? That I was... Uh, uh, spin coater, the vacuum pump is just uh, a stick to the uh, table. Okay. okay. So, the, the sample should be a, a stick. Uh, so, that's okay. why the vacuum pump is required. And it is very uh, low standard pump. It is not low just, standard, to, no? just to cleanse uh, the, oh. uh, the sample. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you.
So thank that you, I was uh, uh, interested to know, sir. Thank you. I thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions? I think there is no more question. So we uh, okay. round off for this session and thank to uh, Dr. Santan Behra regarding uh, this uh, interesting talk. So thank you very much. So, Thanks this, so much. Is, this, this, this is uh, the end of uh, the third base. So please uh, uh, attend uh, the tomorrow. There is another three lectures are there. Uh, this is one lecture from Alakar. Uh, this is the application of release and catch catalyst. It is basically chemistry based pharmaceutical uh, pharmaceutical uh, compounds. Next is uh, uh, Dr. Mo, uh, Ramesh Malik from IIC Bangalore. He will talk about the tetrahydride as the thermoelectric material. And uh, the Dr. Arindam Biswas. The design and the development of uh, tetrahydride gallium nitrite impact source. So thank you very much, okay, everyone. Great. Thanks so much. This is the end of uh, this session. Thank you. Thanks. One second, Dr. Behra. Thank you very much.